SoCal Gas right now and report an emergency. Um, and uh, the more I'll save the rest for a minute later. So I'm here. Thank you. <laughs> and then Skylar, your video is also not showing quite yet. And then Dennis, as soon as Skylar's on video, you and Craig is back in his seat. <laughs> You're good to go. I'm here. Perfect. Okay. We're good to go here. Got the got the gavel. <laughs> got this got the siding hammer right here. Still have it after almost, I don't want to tell you how long. Anyway, okay, here we go. Good evening, friends and neighbors. I would like to call to order the Malibu Planning Commission regular meeting of the date of April 3rd, 2023. This meeting is being held by teleconference due to the COVID-19 pandemic. That's just not true anymore. <laughs> Commissioners and city staff are participating in this Zoom meeting from the remote locations. All votes will be taken by the Members of the public can participate in the meeting or watch it by going to malibucity.org <clears throat> front slash virtual meeting. At that screen, click on one of two tabs to either watch or sign up to speak on particular items. Those wishing to speak must be present in the Zoom meeting to be recognized. Please sign up before the item has been called by the chair. Those wishing to defer to be those wishing to defer time to someone else intending to speak are not required to sign up, but must be present in the meeting. If instead of speaking, you wish to donate your time to another speaker, please click the raised hand button at the bottom of the Zoom screen when the public hearing for the item is open. A speaker may accept up to five additional minutes, one minute each for each speaker that the first time for a maximum total of eight minutes. Alex, would you please show the slide? If in fact, Alex, you are working this evening. And so our public will know. Somebody will show it. Alex is working with us this evening. Um, if you are using a cell phone or a tablet, you can press star nine to unmute yourself. You can use star nine to raise your hand in the meeting. Yeah, there you go. Commissioners, when you have comments, please raise your hand and I will call on you in turn so we can make our discussion clear for the record and the public. May I have a roll call, please? Commissioner Hill? He's here. <laughs> I know. There he is. Commissioner Jennings? Here. Commissioner Peake? Here. Vice Chair Mazza? Here. Chair Smith? Here. You have a quorum. Terrific. Um, hopefully Mr. or Commissioner Hill's okay. Um, roll call. Uh, approval of the agenda. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to uh, approve the agenda as staff recommends with item 4A continued to 417 and <clears throat> I don't know what to do with 4C, whether it's continued to a date uncertain. Uh, why, don't we, why don't we ask Richard what he plans for that? Uh, Chair, if I may, real quick. Please. Uh, the applicant requested the deviation, uh, or excuse me, removed the deviation request. Uh, should it not need a deviation, there's no requirement for this commission to hear the item. And Pat, do you see as if they've removed the deviation, uh, will that allow it to go back to a director level decision or do I need to keep it here? Sorry, didn't mean to spring this one on you. <laughs> correct. And so, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, I, what I understand is that they will be coming back with different plans, at which point, if those need a deviation, we will schedule that for, for, for uh, a hearing item before this commission. So the right. specific application doesn't need to be continued in that, 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 that application has been withdrawn. So I just uh, make a motion to withdraw that application. So those that that the agenda uh, the motion is to uh, continue the agenda uh, have the agenda staff recommends with item four C 
deleted item 4A uh, continue to the date April 17th. I'll second it. Okay, um, roll call. Vice Chair Mazza? Yes. Commissioner Jennings? Yes. Commissioner Hill? Yes. Commissioner Peake? Yes. Chair Smith? Yes. Motion carries. The posting of the agenda. The agenda for this meeting was properly posted on April 6, 2023. Since we're not in the building, we don't have any ceremony, ceremonial presentations, uh, but we do have written and oral communications from the public. Rebecca, do we have anybody that would like to speak to us tonight? No one has signed up in advance of the meeting. If you're present in the meeting this evening and you would like to speak on an item which is not on the current agenda, please click the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen now. All those fine people we're looking at. Okay. And I'm seeing none. Okay, very good. Uh, commission, we have a- I'm a sorry. Commission. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, somebody just raised a hand in the meeting. Okay. Um, so if you could unmute. Oh. If you could unmute for uh, Bernard okay. Renee. Yes, hi. Um, I'm using my husband's laptop. This is Elaine Renee Weissman about uh, application uh, Cliffside Drive and Grasswood Avenue. I'm just, we're available to answer questions. Okay, and so public comment is for items that are not currently on the agenda. Sorry. So if it's specific to that item, we'll we'll mention that when we get down to that point in the agenda. Okay, I make sure you got that. Um, okay, planning commission and staff comments and inquiries, commissioners. Um, I see Vice Chair's hand is up. It may have been left up from before, but do you have something, Vice Chair Maza? Yeah, a couple things. Um, the the uh, item we we uh, did not hear the gas station uh, at the last meeting. We stated if they didn't come to this meeting, uh, enforcement action would be taken. So my question is, now that we've taken it off our plate, I guess, um, if they don't show up, uh, is it, what happens? Is the enforcement action still going to be taken, or does it come back to us as the original application, or whatever? I think we're allowed to be mean to them starting right now. Chair, would you like me to speak Please. now? Please. Certainly. So we, uh, I've asked our code enforcement officer this morning, uh, once I found out that they had withdrawn their application yesterday to contact the, uh, the applicant for the station owner. The, uh, to see when they would have a complete set of plans to us and also to notify them of the daily violation fee or uh, citation fee. The applicant, after speaking with them, explained they would give us a full set of plans this coming Wednesday, a day after tomorrow, the 5th. The code enforcement officer has put them on notice that if we do not receive those plans by the 5th, that starting Wednesday, they will be subject to daily fines. So about a $500 citation fee is what I was told daily. And so that will start on Wednesday the 5th if we do not receive a complete submittal and it's not the applicant was made aware verbally and in writing that it can't be a partial submittal you know they're they owe us a dollar they can't give us 99 cents it's got to be the full dollar and it's our understanding that what they're presenting at this point is that with the new lighting engineer they hired they have a plan that does not require a deviation and what we're missing at this point and I think Tyler is on the call. He can jump in if I misspeak. Uh, but we have a photometric plan, but we don't have any of the details of the particular light fixtures. And then also the uh, additional information, such as the temperature of the lights, so that we can make certain it's consistent with the ordinance. 
So if they don't follow through on that, then yes, starting, uh, or like I said, our code enforcement officers already involved, contacted them, contacted them today, and starting Wednesday, the citations will start. Okay, Richard, uh, second question, that that is if they don't have an application in. Uh, the other five or six stations, uh, if they put in, if any of these stations put in an application, does that, and you approve it, how long do they have to actually do it? I mean, when do the fines start if they don't, don't do anything? They just give you a set of plans. Certainly. So we've, and Tyler can jump in here if I misspeak. I think I saw him move around. Oh, there he is. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, Tyler, we've approved the other five gas stations, correct? Yes, they're approved through planning and they're just about done with plan check. Right. So it's when folks are non-responsive, like any code enforcement application, when we have to remedy a, a violation, if they do not res respond in a timely manner, and typically, Doug, our code enforcement manager, gives folks two weeks. If they don't respond within two weeks with the materials we asked for, then they are subject to citation. So four of the five gas stations are completing plan check. And once that's done, there'll be a, a, a time window for them to obtain permits and get started on the work. Uh, the other, the, the fifth gas station, if you will, uh, which would be Tyler Crack, the mobile at the corner of PCH and Webway, it has installed its lights. The Chevron, yeah. Chevron, sorry. Okay, and then my last question, which you can answer after Craig, uh, is can you just give us some idea of how bad our schedule is going to be for the next couple of months. It seems like everything's being moving forward along and they're all backing up, but I'm not sure. Do we have super long meetings is my question. And then you can wait till your comments. Just give us that. understand. Commissioner Hill. Oh, thank you. Uh, three things. Number one, I've been really sick for a few days and I had a telehealth to this afternoon and they urged me to go to the emergency room right away. They think I have pneumonia. Um, I don't know if that's called for or not. I'm still, you know, ambulatory and everything. But if I have, uh, if I'm even less coherent than usual, it's because I have a little brain fog and I'm, so hopefully you'll bear with me. And, um, you know, <laughs> if I'm not making sense, let me know. And, um, okay, number two, just generally about lighting. I was going to say this about this item, but uh, just generally, I had asked a while back, what is the, the the minimum requirement for safety, the state requirement for how much light do you have to have for a place to be safe? And I noticed, and and, and we've never gotten that. And I've looked at uh, the Ralph's parking lot at night, late at night, and it's actually pretty dark. And the gas stations, including the one right across the corner at on a Web Way, which is better than it was, but they're still definitely a lot brighter than the Ralph's parking lot. And I just wondered, what are the what are the safety requirements that make those two diff so different? And are the requirements really different? Because basically, you just need to see what you're doing. And Ralph's lighting satisfies that. And the gas station, you know, if it's a security question or whatever, well. A, grocery stores have that too, and B, cameras can see in almost no light these days. So I just don't know. It seems like we should be working from the baseline of what is absolutely required and then saying, what do we allow beyond that? Just a thought. And then the last comment is I got a voicemail from someone concerned about the t tattoo salon and making noises about uh, well, this is going to invite bikers and, and tourists and how how resident serving is this really? And, you know, I, I haven't called them back, um, but because uh, I've, I've been in kind of a state today but with the illness and the sudden gas emergency up the street. Um, so uh, just to put it out there that, that this is clearly something different than a tattoo parlor that we've been talking about. It's a salon. It's a appointment only, high in, et cetera. So that, those are my comments. Thank you. 
Okay. Um, Commissioner Peek. Um, I have no comments other than I'm really happy that we're finally getting around to having businesses and homes in our community comply with the dark sky ordinance. Just putting that out there. I think that it's been a long time coming and something special about seeing the stars at night. So there is that. I gave you the, here, here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No All right, that's it. Okay. Move along. Commissioner Jennings. My only comment is that Craig, your cheeks, you look very flushed. Uh, your cheeks are, are much redder than they usually are. So I would, if you got a thermometer, I'd check and see whether you got a fever. And if you do, I think you'd go ought to go down to the emergency room where I spent most of yesterday. So go take off. Okay. Well, that, sorry to hear that. Um, okay. So, um, I'm the little, uh, the, the, the butterfly here because I went to my training class Thursday for the planning commission down in Anaheim. And I just had a wonderful time. It was great uh, to sit with other people from other cities in our great state was was uh, wonderful and to meet people and talk about all kinds of things. And um, we're all there for the because we love what we're doing and uh, just talking with other people. It was it was uh, it was great. And I got to be honest, um, next year, um, I, I think I'd go all three days. Um, I think it was good for me. I think it's good for everybody. There's just Jesus must have been 500 people in that room. And, um, you know, we I, I had some good classes. I had processing housing development applications under SB 330. Um, I had oh, I had a breakfast before that. We ate. It was great. And um, let's see. And then, oh, we played Planning Commission Jeopardy. They, you know, they have the answer on the board and you put the question to it. So that was a lot of fun. And they gave away prizes. I did not win anything because I'm not as smart as a lot of the people in that room are. And then I had planning commission. Oh, I didn't. Uh, there was planning commission roles and responsibilities and restrictions. And I took that too. So um, I took uh, I took three classes, but I, I could go for all three days next time because um, I think it's a great thing. And I think just the fact that we're all there um, really all kind of working together to do the same thing and to learn and to do all that. So uh with that, I had a I had just a, a great time. And then okay, so one thing on the business side of it. Okay, so you know our over the counter stuff, right? Um I I just I, I know that we're we're we are so truly planning driven, but it'd be great if we could come back around to over the counter stuff. I mean, it, you know, really, if we if there's a way we could we could do a lot of this smaller stuff like that. I mean, instead of having to wait two or three years or a year or whatever to do simple, really simple things. Um, you know, Doug Cleveringer's work would be cut by seventy five percent because you can't. You you know why people do what they do? It's because it takes us a long time to do things. That's not chastising anybody it's just how that's been but it'd be nice if we could work on something or you know staff could come up or or with uh you know director bundy or somebody and, and director malika and whoever if we can put together some kind of a plan where we can do stuff over the count over the counter a little better and and uh, or quicker that would it'd be great for the community that's all and then um that's all i have so uh director malika it's all yours buddy certainly thank you uh to answer Work a little backwards here to answer Craig's question. Um, so the minimum lighting standards, uh, those as required by state, the only reference to those in our lighting code is essentially our dark skies ordinance cannot conflict with the minimum lighting standards. Uh, nevertheless, I'll have a chat with our consultant about that to see if there is an answer to that. Uh, in some cases, um, you know, it, there is some good direction, but yet they don't specify lumens. Uh, for example, when we were dealing with dark skies on the Trancas Country Mart project, the ATM machines, uh, the I think it was the finance code actually stated that the path from the parking space, so from the parking space, the path, and then into the ATM machine had to be well lit. Uh, it didn't say that it had to be a certain amount of lumens, but there had to, it had to be 
well lit so that you could see if somebody were watching you as you, you'd walk to the ATMs. But I can ask our uh, consultant if there's perhaps a better explanation of that and see if they could answer uh, that type of question. Yeah, or maybe it's something like OSHA or something. You know, if it's a safety question, there's there's probably some baseline at the state level. It, it, we kind of ran into this a little bit with the high school pool. Uh, it would have, I was hoping that they had a lumens uh, specification for pool safety, but it just said to adequately, adequately see the pool. I think I forget exactly how, but it, it wasn't to the, where we had somebody saying it had to be X lumens, which is, would be very helpful. Uh, but nevertheless, I can ask that question. In terms of your upcoming agendas, uh, been working really hard with Rebecca to do our best to keep the upcoming agendas reasonable. Uh, for example, on your next meeting on the 17th, at this time, uh, we have a, a, a administrative uh, coastal development permit for wastewater system, and then one continued hearing uh, that was the one from tonight. And then uh, the other item that's on there mm. uh, is the Malibu Inn Motel. That'll be brought to the Planning Commission for their consideration. And then beyond that, we have uh, a remodel and single family, which we can look at having to move. Uh, right now, that's the, the, the tentative plan, <laughs> those uh, four hearings. But once again, I need to make certain that all those reports are complete and ready for publishing this week. Some may drop off to the following meeting. And the following meeting at this time, that would be May 1st, which is where at present I only have one hearing and for a new house and then the continuation of the TUP item. And I met with our consultant today to see how he was progressing on the comments from the commission and he said he was working through them and would have that completed so that you guys could hear the TUP item uh, as continued to the first. So we are trying not to overburden the hearing schedule because I do realize that the motel is a larger item and then also the TUPs, that's another larger item. I know we spent a lot of time on it at the last hearing, uh, but I'm just guessing uh, that, you know, you guys, uh, as a group, you want to have a chance to really look over what we bring back to you and then flesh it out fully. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Richard. Um, okay, is that it? I'm sorry, buddy. Is that it? Yes, it is, Chair. Thank you very much. Yes. Um, okay, consent calendar, previously discussed items. We don't seem to have any. and. We have 3B, we have new items, so we have one, two, and three. Uh, one and three, oh, uh, Vice Chair Mazza, go ahead. So I could pull 3B2. Okay. All right. So one and, one and three are, are uh, our uh, director Malik is anyway, so we're good. So we want to, uh, we'll take 3B2 right now. Request for a determination of use of number 22-001, private tattoo studio in a commercial neighborhood zoning district. And we have, is there a report? Director Malik, are we just? Two. Uh, I can jump in for this one since Brian is no longer with the city. Um, oh, yeah, bummer. I, uh, poor guy was driving upwards of five hours a day. Yeah. So <laughs> I'm yeah. sure that this Monday morning he... <laughs> Pomona's a long way from here. <laughs> Brutal. That is it. Um, so what we have here for you is we brought back the resolution memorializing the Planning Commission's determination that the Planning Commission believes that we will need, uh, should the owner choose to pursue it, 
a conditional use permit application will need to be processed and presented for consideration by this commission. Okay. And we did not issue a CUP, correct? That is correct, Commissioner Maza. Uh, Vice Chair, I apologize. That is correct. The, all that this commission did was memorialize, and, and that's what this resolution does, is memorializes the determination that the commission made. We have instructed the uh, the applicant that uh, made this request uh, that they next the next steps, if they're interested, would be to provide us with an application for a conditional use permit uh, that, as I mentioned, would be decided upon by this body. Okay. Um, my only comment is after reading that again, I personally can't see how the tattoo parlor is is anything other than visitor serving because you don't go back once you get it. Uh, so if we bring this up to a vote, I guess we do. Uh, I'm going to vote no. It's it's uh, what bothers me is it seems to be that we're saying that this is basically the same as a, a veterinarian, which is veterinarian is most definitely a neighborhood serving um, use because you don't bring your dog a hundred miles to go to a vet unless you're, you know, you got the $10,000 dog, I guess. And you go more than once and I don't see any, any, um, any, neighborhood use for uh, a tattoo parlor other than in a, in a, a C, CV zone. Those are my comments. Okay, Commissioner Hill is next and then- I got the Chair Smith, before we oh, get into uh, deliberations, we should, we should open it up to public comment prior okay. to getting into the deliberations. All right, yeah, very good, thank you. Uh, if I may just, in situations like this where we have asked staff to come back with a resolution, we've the issue before us is whether what staff came back with accurately expresses what we did in the hearing itself. It's not an opportunity to relitigate everything that we discussed back in the original hearing. So with that in mind, I, we still have to have public hearing, but but that's the issue before us is just that limited. Okay, very good. Um, Rebecca, do we have, I see a couple of hands, but do we? Uh... Um, yes, that applicant, uh, Catriona McDade Kelly, um, would be our first public speaker. Okay. Followed by Ryan. And Alex, can you unmute for Kat? Hi, this is Katrina. Um, you know, I just wanted to respond to um, what you just said. You know, clients honestly come back to us okay. over and over and over again. We have clients that come to us for 10 years. We have clients that come to us for 15 years. And um, so it is actually an ongoing, our, that's what makes what we do so different. We're not doing single session, you know, tattoos that are done in you know one session or, or an hour or whatever we're doing tattoos that take years years it's, it's a lifetime commitment so i have to dispute that this is a you know a, a, a business that we don't have repeat customers or people don't come back to us they they, in fact they come back to us constantly to finish their work we can never finish in one setting one sitting so that is the thing is like they're continually coming back yeah. And a lot of our clients are actually Malibu residents. Um, so again, uh, that, I, I don't just incorrect. Yeah. yeah. That's all I have to say at this time. Sorry, I just had to respond to that. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ryan. Uh, yes. Um, the reason I'm speaking to this is that the task of the staff to try and come up with um, 
a justification in the language that would comport to the use is is an impossible task. That's the reason. Um, whether the commissioners thought that this was a high end operation or classy, um, there there are no conditions that would support that. There's like no valet parking or free champagne or any you know anything for the reasoning um, that was given uh, for the hearing and so forth. Uh, the idea of the zoning in this city is that the use be appropriate for the neighborhood in this case. And I have nothing against the tattoo operation or parlor. And I have uh, questioning why these folks don't want to have the greater success that they would achieve if they were to locate in the commercial visitor serving area of the city. And it would be closer for the destination uh, international travel business and so forth that was listed in the record uh, for this uh, operation. And it would be much more appropriate for it to be uh, located in the Civic Center area, for instance. So you can't change location, location, location. And the neighborhood zoning is to promote businesses that are neighborhood serving for repeat business for travel and trip reduction and time reduction for repeat business by locals in their local neighborhood area. And if this was a locally serving business, which I think everybody realizes is not, um, there would need to be five or six of them throughout the 20 something miles of Malibu to achieve uh, compliance with what the, the neighborhood commercial zoning uh, calls for. So, I, I see you're leaning toward uh, creating the exception to become the rule. Um, I think it's very bad precedent, and I don't think it's economically supportive of all the businesses that are displaced every time you grant an exemption to uh, a business that is out of zoning, out of character, that is not neighborhood or resident serving, and that is for international commerce, or should be actually zoned and be paying the rent rate appropriate for the zone. Now, this forces the competitors, the legitimate businesses that are neighborhood serving and resident serving to a higher price point because the landlord is receiving or can charge and get away with charging the type of extra rent that goes with the special exception and uh, hosting a tenant that, that should be in a different zone. So it's not a possible task because it just doesn't comport. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Our next speaker will be. I lost audio. Can Is anybody hearing anything? Um, I lost audio briefly, but I've got it back. Oh, no, our, our next speaker will be Joe Drummond, followed uh, by rebuttal from our applicant. And our applicant will have about a minute and a half left on our clock. Uh, question, why do we allow rebuttal? Well, it's with the, at the uh, pleasure of the chair. Um, so we'll circle back to Dennis for a decision on that after hearing Joe Drummond. Hi there, everyone. Can well, you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. <clears throat> I just wanted to, I mean, I understand that this is a, a, a very artistic, specialized studio and I do understand what Ryan is saying to allow the interpretation in this zone, this new interpretation would be setting a precedent. So once you open the door to this concept, it can pop up everywhere. We don't want to be Venice, we're Malibu. But so I think you can allow it, but you have to put conditions on the permit to make sure that it cannot be done anywhere else, basically, if you are going to allow this. Basically, it has to be a one-time thing or, or um, like, I don't know how you do it, but whatever you can do. I guess that's a possibility. That would be what you need to do. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Drummond. And Chair Smith, would you like to allow the applicant to respond or not? I think they can. And let me reduce time. Okay. And if you could unmute for Katrina. Hey, so just again to respond, you know, we are very much neighborhood serving. As I said, a lot of our clients are in Malibu. They have long-term relationships with us. 
we are also booked for years. So being in a high traffic zone is absolutely not what we need and absolutely not what we want. We're a very quiet, unobtrusive, creative business that we're super exclusive. So, so the idea of being in a busy civic center environment would not work for what we do. It, it's a peaceful, you know, it's a, it's, it's an experience that people need to be in a peaceful environment for. And so that is why we chose the area that we did. And that's why we've gone through this whole process. I also want to say in response to Ryan that I agree. I think that the planning commission trying to make these rules is challenging and I would love to offer our help to make, you know, the SCUP that is extremely difficult for other people to apply for because we also don't want tattoo shops popping up in Malibu. We absolutely don't want it to be like Venice. We don't want to be in Venice. That's why we're applying to Malibu and that's why we've gone through this entire process so that we can be in Malibu. Um, and we would love to help you write a CUP that would be absolutely impossible for anyone else to be granted because what we do, we're the only tattooers in the world that do what we do. So... That's what I have to say. Do you have anything to add? Thank you. And scrolling through, I don't see anyone else that has not already spoken. Okay, we'll close the public hearing. We'll come back to the to us. Uh, go back to Commissioner Hill, who was going to speak I guess right. I guess we're allowed to do a little bit of that not probably a lot but go ahead yeah well all right a couple of things to, to Jeff's point that we're just talking about it was the resolution accurate to our intent I wondered did we not also liken this to a beauty salon all the resolution says is veterinary uh, and I thought that the discussion was a little broader about how this fit in with other stuff in, in that zoning district I mean, to my mind, yeah, it is. There are some features of it that are um, more medical in a way, but in some very essential ways, it is maybe more like a beauty salon too. But I thought we talked about that. I, yeah, go ahead, yeah, go ahead, go ahead Jeff. I, I think we did talk about that, but the, but the key point is that the veterinary hospital was the one use in the zone that required a conditional use permit right we talked about doctor's offices but that wasn't remember we got into some confusion yeah, yeah. about where the, whether it was in the municipal code or the, or the lip so right. that's why it only mentions um the veteran okay. hospital. good point and then just um i'll just mention that yeah i think what katrina just said about it not wanting to be in a commercial tourist type zone is exactly right and to my mind the way it was described to us, this was probably more resident serving than visitor serving just because of the clientele. Maybe a few internationals, but mostly people with a lot of money. Um, and so uh, I wondered also, did we not discuss whether it would be by appointment only? And and what, what would that be? Or would that be something that would just be reserved to the CUP process? That's right. That, yeah. that, that's That's a CUP issue. Okay. All right. Those are my comments. Commissioner Peak. I'd like to make a uh, motion to approve the, this with a staff's recommendation. I'll second it. Great. May we have a roll call, please? Commissioner Peak. Yes. Commissioner Jennings. Yes. Commissioner Hill. Yes. Vice Chair Mazza. No. Chair Smith. Yes. Motion carries. Cool. Okay, page one. We are on to 4B. Let's go get my Lynn test for that. Coastal development number 15 002, variance numbers 16 019 and 17 52, site plan review number 16 041. And minor modification number 21005, an application for the construction of a new two story single family residence and associated development continued from March 20th of this year. Here we have a staff report. Please. Ah, Assistant Director Fernandez, we have him right there. Okay. 
Hi, good evening. I may need to uh, turn off my camera. I think I'm having some internet issues. I'm at City Hall, um, but that doesn't, um, I guess, matter uh, uh, in terms of uh, connectivity issues. So I'm going to turn off the just the camera, but I'll uh, go ahead and present the item. Hopefully the connection will be better uh, this way. Uh, good evening, Chair uh, Smith and members of the Planning Commission. This is a continued item from uh, the last planning commission meeting. The item was continued before um, the public hearing was open. Uh, next slide, please. Good evening, oh, excuse me. Um, next slide. Uh, the subject parcel is access from uh, Verde Mesa Lane, uh, which is a private, uh -oh. private cul-de-sac. That, that ends uh, near the uh, parcel's frontage. The house uh, immediately to the east uh, was destroyed by the Woolsey fire. Uh, next slide. The project consists of a new uh, two-story single family residence, uh, new swimming pool and other uh, associated development. Uh, next slide. The uh, application includes variances for the fuel modification to extend into ESHA and construction of slopes steeper than 2.5 to 1. Uh, historical data show that at the time Verde Mesa Lane was constructed, a dirt mount uh, was placed over the subject parcel's frontage and on the adjacent parcel to the west. Uh, this is a manufacturer slope that the applicant is requesting to build the driveway over. Uh, the rest of the development is sited on slopes flatter than three to one. Also included is a site plan review for height up to 28 feet uh, for a pitch roof um, and a minor modification to reduce the required front yard setback. Uh, the front yard setback reduction allows the residents to be sited further away from ESHA thus minimizing uh, uh, ESHA impacts. Uh, next slide. Across the rear of the property is a stream uh, with riparian habitat. Uh, the proposed residence was designed uh, to overlap fuel modification areas with the neighboring resident immediately to the east. Uh, unfortunately, the neighboring residence was destroyed in the Woolsey fire but the new owners are pursuing applications to rebuild the same residence plus 10%. Uh, they require few modifications for uh, both the proposed residence and uh, the uh, destroyed residence. Um, fire rebuilt uh, will overlap for the most part. Um, how many feet uh, further into ESHA? Um, uh, about half will be covered by the neighbor's fuel modification area. Uh, the uh, next slide, please. The project was designed to meet the required 10,000 square foot uh, development area. The proposed development area is uh, 8,944 square feet. Uh, next slide. Uh, staff conducted a recent story pole inspection and took uh, recent uh, pictures of the primary view location from the neighboring uh, primary view location uh, on the neighboring property, as well as took uh, photographs of the story poles representing the proposed residence. Uh, next slide. The property owner across the street uh, requested a primary view determination as a um, a result of the proposed residence. This is the view uh, towards the uh, south uh, from her primary view location. It shows uh, blue water views across the middle. Uh, towards the right uh, are the, uh, it's the orange mesh that represents the proposed residence. The proposed residence is not expected to obstruct blue water views. Um, however, it will block non-native a vegetation along the hillside and a row of trees and developing along the horizon, uh, which currently obstructs, obstructs the ocean. A staff uh, determined that the proposed development would not be uh, obstructing any impressive scenes from the neighbor's primary view location. Uh, next slide. 
since the last planning commission uh, meeting, uh, the agenda report and resolution uh, were updated to include uh, scenic resource findings. Staff was made aware that Uh, the story poles for the proposed residents are intimately uh, visible from a segment of Canaan Doom Road at a distance of um, 1,300 feet. Um, uh, Canaan Doom Road is a uh, identified scenic road for the LCP. Uh, from the location where the story poles are visible, the proposed residents would uh, be surrounded by other large single family residents in the same neighborhood. The proposed residence will not obstruct any impressive scenes uh, of the mountains or canyons. The view from Cane and Doom is uh, also uh, mostly obstructed with vegetation and a chain-link fence, uh, which is uh, it's all parallel to the street. Uh, therefore, the project is expected to have less than significant adverse uh, scenic impacts. Uh, next slide. Uh, uh, staff. It is staff's opinion that the proposed project will not uh, have adverse uh, scenic impacts from Keenan Doom and recommends that the Planning Commission approve the proposed project as conditioned. This uh, concludes my presentation and I'm available for questions. Okay, great. Thank you, sir. Um, okay, back to us. Uh, disclosures. Uh, Vice Chair Maza. None. Commissioner Jennings. I visited uh, the site um, when it was before us the last time. Um, not an easy place to find. Uh, Google Maps had the address all over the place. It was really difficult to kind of get to it. But uh, all I did was take a look at the lay of the land and the views across the canyon toward Canaan Doom and so forth. Commissioner Peak. Same as Mr. Jennings. Commissioner Hill. Uh, yeah, a couple couple things. We I, I did have some email discussion with Adrian about the misnaming of the streets and how that might affect noticing. Um, he pointed out, and I appreciate that, that that legally the tax assessor's map is incorrect, as is the Google map here, and the, the, there there is a a more official uh, map that is correct. But I, I wonder. I mean, this is not like. If someone inadvertently addressed Birdview Avenue as Birdview Street, for example, in that case, mail would still get there and anyone reading a notice would understand the location. But in this case, there are actually two separate, distinct, unconnected streets, Verity Mesa Lane and, and Drive, So, according to, the, to both of those maps. So I think it, it, it may be a question for us to opine on whether it's proper notice to have referenced an address that is incorrect on both those maps, what in terms of what is the public standard of information? So we can talk about that if you want, um, but just by way of disclosure, I also looked on Google Earth Pro with the 3D terrain modeling and found that this is visible from Kane and Doom Road. The staff pointed out there is a chain link fence there, but that's temporary, a uh, Woolsey affected property. It's six foot high in the front yard setback, and even then you can see both through it and above it from a, a slightly higher roadway. So um, I, I think I think um, the view from that road is something that we, we have some discussion about the, its significance. Okay. Um, yeah, I didn't I didn't talk with anybody. I did uh, at a time go back in there. <laughs> and look at a couple of fire rebuilt lots and I liked it back there and um, maybe a little bit of noise through Canaan Doom, but kind of a cool spot. Um, that's all I've got. So um, let's see. Uh, we can get a, so are there any comments from the public about this one? Yes, so we want to open that up. Rebecca, do we have anyone? And no one has signed up in advance of the meeting to speak in public. If you are present in the meeting and would like to express an opinion on this project, please click the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen. The project architect, Ryan Levis, and the owner, Tom Marin, are both present in the meeting to respond to any questions of the commission this evening and are available to, for potential for rebuttal should someone wish to speak. Okay. Well, um, and at this time, I am not seeing a raised hand in the meeting. Okay. However, uh, we do have a couple of people trying to join the meeting at the moment. 
Okay, we'll wait. Um, I mean, it, it is up to you as the chair if you would like to wait to see if they intended to speak on this item. I see um, their hands are raised. So I see um, the well, at the bottom down there. The hands that are raised are from Commissioner Hill and Vice Chair Mazza. Oh, okay. And um, Norm Haney has connected to the meeting. Joe Drummond is still trying to connect. And I don't know if either of the two of them have an intent to speak on this item. Okay. I think I think we I think if somebody wanted to, they had a I think you're safe to close. Okay. Commissioner Hill was first. So back to us here. Commissioner Hill, go ahead. Actually, John had his hand up first. Oh yeah, that's right. I should have known better. Go ahead, Vice Chair. I should have known better. Uh, um first I want to discuss the address situation. To me, it's not which whether the, the assessor has it right the question is does the fire department have it right and do the people who live there has the my question is has the city city allocates addresses has the city allocated this address in the street or is this just something somebody named their driveway Because I, what I worry about is house is on fire. You call up and you say it's on whatever it is, and nobody can find it. Well, if it's on fire, I'm pretty sure they'll find it. But that's <laughs> fair because the other street is halfway across town. Yeah. Do you know if the city has ever issued the address and an official street name? So, um, the city records do show the correct information um and as uh share with um uh commissioner hill uh, we we had the track maps that um you know that were used to create the the subdivision for the area as well as the subdivision for the other uh, area where um, they were identifying that to be uh, Verde Mesa Lane. Um, the Verde Mesa, the, the fake Verde Mesa Lane um, was, it, it's not a, a road, it's in fact a driveway. So driveways are, are, not, are not labeled or, or named uh, only streets. And so um, it, it's, it's un, it's unusual for this to happen. Uh, I'm not sure uh, maybe we can reach out to the county and uh, have them um, update their maps uh, to correctly um, provide the names. But all our records and um, you know the official records identify this correctly, uh, all our uh, addressing. And um, yes, when there isn't any development on a property, uh, Chances are there is no address assigned to that particular parcel, and then they can make a request to the city, and the city can then officially provide uh, an address. Um, and you know, all I can say is, you know, everything that's been addressed on this street has been addressed, uh, you know, using uh, Verde Mesa Lane. Uh, so everything's been consistent uh, pursuant to city records. Okay, this is a question, of Patrick. Uh... Can we require the applicant to correct the uh, tax records so the mapping services pick up the right place? You know, th th that's basically conditioning the project on a, I don't want to say discretionary, I assume that should be ministerial, but act of another agency. So, you know, I think that the Condition could potentially include use best efforts or attempt, but requiring that seems to be a bit out of the scope of our jurisdiction because we can't really speak for the what that county assessor's process is or the or the or, or those tax records are. All we can do, and, and and my office was was in touch with planning during this when when Commissioner Hill, you know, brought up a valid issue. Um, I believe that the Google Maps does 
you know, go a, a different one and a unique thing. I believe Microsoft Bing Maps actually shows the right one, which is which is unique. But so that that idea of a condition to make the applicant reach out to a different agency or government body to correct one is not one I would advise. No. If we use the word use best efforts, is there a way that staff can determine that they were used? I mean, I would say that, you know, the, the maybe best efforts was what, what was a poor choice of words attempt. And in that way, as long as the applicant, you know, once again, I'm, I'm kind of speaking off the top of my head because I, I have no idea about what that process is, but at least reached out and said, I've been made aware of this. Can you please correct it? And then if, if you if we want to add something like that to the satisfaction of, of, of the director, that would seemingly be fine. Or maybe say a documented attempt. So we actually get a copy of their letter or something. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Um, thank you. Oh, uh, let's see here. Oh, I have one other question. And that is that the ESHA map you showed me, the clearance map, you showed where they overlapped, cross a blue line stream. And I don't think you can clear a blue line stream of Parian habitat. Um, so I'm wondering if that should be adjusted in in depth so it doesn't cross the blue line stream. Since it's a major stream that goes all the way to the ocean. Are, are we talking about the fuel modification? Yeah, the fuel modification. So the fuel modification uh, plans um, were drawn uh, in the specifications required by the fire department. Yeah, that, that may be true, but the fire department doesn't. So uh, we, we can't really uh, revise those uh, since those are their requirements. Um, however, um, uh, to your point, um, the fuel modification uh, that extends into riparian habitat or a stream um, only requires that um, the debris that's collected at the bottom of, of the ravine or anywhere in the area and dead branches of trees be removed uh, in order to comply with the fuel modification. So it could across the 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 right or the um, the stream. It's just that within the area of the stream, that's all they could do, um, and that's uh, pursuant again to the fire department fuel modification requirements. Well, we in the past have changed our our. Fuel modifications when they, for example, when they go straight into Esha, we've had them less than 300 feet in the past, and, and it's been an action of the Planning Commission. So what can we, if you looked at the map, you probably knock off 20 feet or something, and, and you're not you're not messing with a blue line stream. Technically, the fire department has to go to fish and game to touch them. They don't trump federal law. And uh, and True. so I'm just trying to avoid that. If you think the fire department can get a permit to clear a stream, then we should leave it in. But I don't think they can. And I don't think the applicant can either, since the stream is on his property. It, it has been standard practice, again, for fuel modifications to show their full 200-foot extent. Um, and then... Um, again, you, you don't need uh, fish and wildlife if all they would be doing is removing, you know, trash and debris that's collected uh, in in the riparian habitat area and then removing dead branches, which is all they would be required to do within um, the fish and wildlife jurisdiction. So um, that, that, say that anywhere in our staff report, or can we put that in there? Now, now, now if you want it to uh, require that they um, negotiate with the fire department or a modified fuel modification uh, so that they can revise it. I would, I would, you know, I, I would, I don't know if that would be possible. Um, so I, I would hesitate to add that as a condition um, in case it isn't possible. We have changed fuel modification zones as a fire commission. Only when the only when they bring their fuel modifications already approved by the fire department with with the uh, adjusted uh, boundaries, 
Um, and those are the only instances that I'm aware of, unless Richard can remember any other incident. Is Richard still around? Yes. No, I, I think Adrian, I agree with you on how you characterize that. And the only thing I would add is I feel like in situations where we modified fuel modifications, we might have actually continued it so they could go to the fire department uh, because we've, we've always worked with the fire department and not overstep their uh, Department of Forestry division. So, which means that we can continue this. All right, and otherwise, can we put in the language and say, if, if you say the requirement is, you may only remove dead sticks and branches. Can't we put that in there? That's that language. So we can't hear you. Be there. It's part of their fuel modification requirements. Where can you show us where it is in the staff report? It would be in the uh, in the uh, fuel mod the approved fuel modification plan. Um, I'm not sure. If we'll look to. to it would have to stay in there. That you can't do that. It, it's it's part of the fire department fuel modification guidelines. So it's it's part of their requirements for fuel modification, and I've seen that language in the fuel modification plans. It it you know it provides you with with uh, what you can and can't do based on all the different zones. Um, Have you ever seen a fireman come out and inspect it? Uh, <clears throat> I, I I don't uh, I'm not around when those inspections take place. I'm I'm just not seeing a lot of traction on this, Vice Chair Mazza. Well, there will be traction when somebody complains, but go ahead, skip it. I'm just trying to save the applicant grief. Uh, okay, um, I would like to make a motion, and you can vote it down. That. Uh, uh, we approve the project as recommended with the applicant required to make a documented attempt to correct address problems on the property with the L.A. County tax assessor. Um, and that the last 30 feet of the clear, uh, fire department clearance be restricted to only um dead branches and whatever that says in the uh in the fire department requirements i want to put it right up front because i doubt if the applicant or his architect has read the fire department details or his contractor so i'd like to put it in our resolution it should have no effect if what you say is true it's already there but it'll be in our resolution rather than some obscure document in the back of uh, in in some manual somewhere. I'll, I'll second that for discussion. Commissioner Jennings, is your suggestion, John? Is your motion rather that um, that we put into our resolution that as uh, in the last or the. the westernmost or easternmost 30 feet of the fuel modification zone, the applicant will have to comply with the fuel modification requirements stated in the uh, fire department's fuel modification plan? Yeah, I would, uh, I would like to amend that to say within 10 feet of the blue line stream, because I don't know the 30 feet I picked out of the air. Okay, so within 10 feet of the Blue Run stream, they have to comply with the, with whatever requirements are stated in the fire department's fuel modification plan, right? Well, I would, what... I would like to, and if I can get your vote, I'll change it. But uh, I'd like to say, as required by the fire department, blah, blah, to remove only and exactly the words they say. Well... Sticks and do, do we know what the exact words they say are? Because I'm I'm willing to support the idea that they're required to 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 comply with the fire department's fuel modification plan, 
and specifically say in our resolution that they have to do that. But we don't know. I don't know what the fire department resolution says, and and apparently nobody else here does either. So you lost me there. Well, the reason I'm saying it is so they know. And and I think if we put it in our resolution, that tells them that they need to go find that document and find out what it says and comply with it because that's what we're telling them to do. Well, uh, Richard, do we have the the language that you quoted? Maybe you can read it, you know, sticks and stones and whatever it was. Certainly, that, that was Adrian. Um, I believe he's looking. Uh, let me, in, let me take, Commissioner, document. take Commissioner Peake real quick. Go ahead, Commissioner Peake. Um, there was a little bit of question in regards to the address and whatnot, and I think it's the it's my understanding that the county doesn't um, officially even allow the property to have an address till it's completed until the permits are finaled for the single family residence. So I just wanted to put that out there so that everybody knows that. Well, they have to send them their tax bill. I understand that, but I'm just letting well, you know. That's why I said the, the uh, not the county, I said the tax assessor. All right, well, I was I was trying to address the question in regards to the fire department and whatnot and people showing up there. And I'm just letting you know that they are not going to deal with that address until the permits are completed for the said home that we're discussing right now in Verde Mesa Lane. So you're saying that, for example, a lot across the street from me is empty, never been built on. I could go over there and light it on fire and they wouldn't come. <laughs> if 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 they don't have if the property does not have a recorded address already already. I'm saying that property does they all do. But uh, John, you're you're failing to under to realize that most people when they call in a fire they're going to give an address of a nearby house. And I, I, I think that that's, that goes without saying, you could call the fire department and say, I'm on Pacific Coast Highway, or you could say, I'm in the middle of nowhere. And they're going to either not know where you are, but they're going to use something called GPS. It's going to go to your cell phone and it's going to tell them where you are. So I, I think that we're just like kind of going down a little bit of a nut job road here. And well, let's just <laughs> stick to what the plan is. And the plan is to focus on the project. I very much understand the concerns. I think as Jeff does as well in regards to adhering to the fire department's plan down in the area that's in, near the ASHA. And if we can find that language, we see it. If not, let's move on and let's either yeah, approve the only or deny. I'm saying this is I doubt. I understand what you're saying. I doubt when they build this house. All of a sudden, that address will pop up. It's already there, and it doesn't work. What it needs to uh, pop up in it is it needs to pop up into the fire truck's computer system. And we're not that's not our job to deal with that right now, okay? That's their job. So let's th let them do their job, and let's do our job. Do you want to approve the house, or do you not want to approve the house? Very simple. I don't want to burn the neighborhood down. That's all. Very simple. Okay, I'm not, nobody's trying to imply that here. Nobody would want to do that. I know. I just don't see under my motion why they shouldn't attempt to straighten it out. So when somebody tries to go to their house and they put John, it in, if they have a half wood of a brain, they're, they're going to straighten it out because it's in their best interest. So hang on, Vice Chair. Mr. Levis has got his hand raised. Mr. Levis, uh, can we unmute him, please? <clears throat> Good evening, um, esteemed commissioners and other participants. Thank you for. Uh, giving me some time here. I just want to make a point that we did have to go to the fire department and get preliminary planning approval for our water flow, fire flow, and our walk around distancing. And at such time, the address was readily achievable or searchable in their system. And Chris Canelli at the time clearly recognized it as a Bonafide lot. That answers the question. I withdraw. I, with Craig's permission, I withdraw that portion of the sure, uh, sure of the uh, uh, motion. As long as the fire department can find you, I have no problem. Uh, do we have the language, uh, Adrian? So I, I'm I'm still looking. Um, the the only thing I want to point out is that um, 
Commissioner Mazza, you mentioned 10 feet, and unfortunately, um, the language that I'm looking for only applies uh, within riparian habitat and stream. And so that's what um, I'm saying. So, but if you say within 10 feet of that area, the, the 10 foot area, unfortunately, would uh, would be required to um, be thinned, um, uh, similar to other zone C requirements. Okay. Maybe, maybe John could change his riparian, motion. It says to... riparian habitat can be thinned. Because... The Coastal Commission doesn't say. It can. I'm looking for the specific language. Give me a second. I, the language in the in the plans is very difficult to read. So give me a second. Hopefully, I can find it in the next uh, few minutes. Should we move on? Well, we have a motion. Oh, you guys, you got okay. We're gonna you're gonna take away one, and John wants to keep. Vice Chair wants to keep this language in there. Do you, let's. We could take a, a quick vote and see if that's going to hold. Well, we don't know the language yet, so the motion. I don't, I don't need to hear the language. I, I think they, they, you voting. just heard. Hang on, you just heard from Mr. Levis and what they went through for the whole thing. I'm done. So let's take a vote. No, I object, Patrick. Can you vote on an incomplete motion? Well, <laughs> you have to wait until the language is determined. Point of order. Well, hang on. But so then, so then, if the motion, if the motion is incomplete, then it can't. It's not on the floor, then I guess someone else can make let, it. Let's, let's let Adrian look for the language and we can talk about other stuff in the meantime. What right. other stuff do you want to talk about? Oh, no, I have about. lots of stuff to talk about. Commissioner Peak. I'd like to make a motion to approve the project as staff's recommendation. And so that would be, and so I think just to make sure everything's clear, I'm going to treat that as a substitute motion. And so the, the order of operations would be we would vote on the substitute motion first, and then if that fails, go to the original motion. Great. I'll second it. I think it's a very sad day when we can't spend two minutes to do things correctly. We've got we've got about 20 into this it one. It the way you operate when you're slack. But go ahead and, and follow Mr. Donegan's motion. You don't have a second yet, but I see uh, you do. We, we do have, second. we have a second from Commissioner okay. Jennings. I, I, just wanted, I want to be sure that it was Commissioner Peake's motion. It was not mine. It was. Can I just say, I have plenty to talk about still. We're not near a vote. Well, we're near a vote. Let's take you a vote. Shut him off without there. Wait a minute, wait a minute. If, 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 if Commissioner Hill has more Items that he wants to discuss on this project, he should be given the chance to discuss okay, it right before we yeah, take I mean, a vote. I haven't, I haven't even begun. So, okay, uh, since we've been talking a lot about ESHA, I'll jump to that in my schema here. But to me, uh, it's a question of justifying the ESHA variance. The staff report makes the argument because even if you had a smaller project, there would still be some ESHA impact and there are some overlapping of fuel modification mod zones that therefore the um, any amount of impact is okay and i don't agree i think that we have a duty to minimize impacts i don't think we just say oh just because there'd be some in any case with any development so the question in one that i would want to know about the ESHA impacts is do we have any evidence on the table and i don't know that we do from the surrounding vicinity maybe 500 feet or a thousand feet that other homes have enjoyed a comparable expansion into sensitive habitat, such that not allowing it here would be a deprivation. That would be what you need for a variance. I don't see we have the evidence. I, I mean, maybe a bunch of those houses have done similar expansions into the ESHA, but um, I don't see an, an exhibit on that. And I sort of feel like if, if, if the exhibit hasn't been presented to us, then sort of prima facie, we have to assume that the case hasn't been made. So I guess this is a question for staff. What um, do we have, can we characterize at all the degree to which others have been allowed sort of a, a licentious expansion into the ESHA? <laughs> um, so there's, uh, 
there is a house uh, immediately next door. The house was there at the time. Uh, by the way, this application was submitted eight years ago. Um, and so at the time, the house to the east uh, was still there um, uh, before the fire took it down. Um, but but that house was um, uh, in line with the proposed residence. Um, however, they are closer to the stream as the stream takes a, a curve and um, moves away, I guess, from the subject property. Um, so, so that house had even more actually impact. That one did. And the fuel modification from that house overlapped with most of the fuel modification of the proposed residents. Um, and the proposed residence does extend further out. And that's just because um, it's on the side. Now there is another house or another adjacent lot owned by the same uh, 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 property owner as the subject property owner. Uh, and the plan for that site would also be to develop it at some point. Um, and then you will have the fuel modifications complete of the development on the same side of the street. And uh, I would imagine that the impacts of every subsequent house would be less as they're uh, overlapping with each other. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, so before I get to my next or questions and, and, and um, concerns, um, just for the record on this point, it just seems like when you're trying to justify a variance for ESHA impact, once you get above something like, you know, I don't know, 5,000 square feet for a single family home, it gets harder to allow justifying more, a, a bigger house and more environmental impact, given that, you know, your, your house should be suitable for purpose beyond that size. So uh, that's just something to, for the planners to think about. A, a, on a couple of questions about viewing. Could, could, could we? Could we? Have, are you open to some comments on that? Because there's. Yeah, absolutely. In, in my view, there's a pretty clear answer. This is a ten thousand square foot project, and the if you if you look at the provisions relating to the ten thousand square foot area that's allowed, even if there are extensions into Esha, it's in the section that talks about no takings. It's talking about these are the minimum amounts that uh, should be allowed in order to avoid a taking. The act itself, the Coastal Act, clearly states, and, and as everything under the Coastal Act says, this act shall never be interpreted to, to affect a taking of any private property, because that's, that's the way it was set up. So the 10,000 square feet is designed, it's, it's, the, it, it's the concession by the state that, okay, ESH is important, this is important, that's important, but you got to give the guy the 10,000 square feet or the 25% of the uh, the lot side, whichever is less. But but the 10,000 is a maximum and you- yeah, No, it's the, it's, the, it's the amount that avoids a taking. That's what they're saying. They said, we're not gonna, we're not gonna get into the whole de uh, definition of what's a taking and what's not a taking. We're gonna say arbitrarily 10,000 square feet. You get that, you don't get more. Comment? Before I, I go on, yeah. Vice Chair Maza. The city of Malibu has never been sued for a taking. A takings are exceedingly rare. They are never 10,000 square feet. The court has established 800 as the minimum to establish a taking. Saying 10,000 <laughs> is a taking simply does not follow with California state law. And Patrick can comment on that. But there is never find a taking for a ten thousand square foot house. I think we have an you know an ongoing discussion and argument about this that's rapidly getting into the weeds. Um, we we I think we're aware of each other's positions on this, right? Well, I, it's just that was a misstatement of fact. I just want to point that. Yeah. Out. No, you're right. The, <laughs> <laughs> But we're not talking about this project right now, then, when we go down that rabbit hole. Well, well, we are, because you're saying that it ought to be reduced and pulled back from ESHA, even if it means that there 
10,000 square foot development area is reduced as a result. At least that's what I hear you say. Well, if they're asking for a variance for the ESHA impact, that implies discretion, right? So why would, I, I'm, I'm not, you know, this is me now being fuzzy because I'm sick, but if they, if they're asking for the variance for the uh, ESHA impact, then clearly there's, that's, that's the fuel mod going beyond the 10,000 feet. No, it's it's the same argument that goes on when you've got a house that that you get to get a property that's all issue, and you say, okay, fine, you got to let them build what they can build. You you have to process it as a variance, but that's simply because you're that's the mechanism <laughs> by which by where you get to the result. But the ten thousand square feet, if you you know, just read the LIP. It's in the section about takings, and that's why it's there. The LIP states. That if you have a property that's all ESHA, if it's a thousand acres, you get ten thousand square foot building pad, not house. Okay. No, see, okay, John, it's a ten thousand square foot development area. That's right. the term they use. Right. And yeah. my understanding is that that's what this project does use is the ten thousand square foot development area. Now it's not a ten thousand square foot house. Okay, and any house in that development area. As Craig says, it requires a variance. When it does, we have the ability to see if that house is designed to minimize. Okay, is the four, is the two thirds used? Is the setback used? Uh, is there a variance for front yard setback, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? Not just oh, you get automatically whatever you want. That's no, and nobody's arguing that, John. That's a straw man. Well, that's what was being said. You get to build ten grand if you want to. No, you got no, to. No. You. That was never said. Okay. Well, anyway, uh, I believe that we are required because it's a variance, as Craig says, to protect Esha. I don't know why we're arguing about cleaning out a stream when it's very obvious in the stream section of the LIP. You can't do that, okay? Very obvious when they say you need fish and game approval, you've got to get it before it gets approved. We don't have an approval on this staff report. We don't, and we need one if that's what you're going to do. So all I'm trying to do is get around a little rinky-dink thing about how far the, the clearance area goes by modifying it not to violate the stream part of the ESHA, of the LIP. RLIP, and not to violate the federal law on getting prior approval from uh, stream, whatever the stream agency is called. Um, that's what it was required. We don't have prior approval here. So unless we do something, <clears throat> we are not allowed to approve this. Can, uh, Commissioner Peek. Um, so, uh, John. I would very much like to incorporate the language that you're kind of referencing in a hypothetical that we can't currently find. And I think that there's probably some agreement on that from some other commissioners, but I don't know if we can find it. So my question is to Patrick, how do we deal with this? I would potentially bring in Adrian and, and, and Richard here in, in, in terms of, is there language that we think, while we do not have it specifically, adequately addresses the concerns to, of us. To achieve that goal. Right. And okay. so I, I believe I understand what, what, what Vice Chair Maza is, is, is positing. However, I'm not quite there yet to formulate specific language. So, so Director Malika, can you at least help me out a little bit or, or no? Certainly. Um, I've, and I've also been looking through the LIP as we sit here because it's got some guidance on clearing of state lands. Um, Adrian, do you, I'm without a magnifying glass, I can't read these plans. I'll be honest. <laughs> the, the, uh, the fine print there, I could do the pretty pictures. Here you go. But right uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Run out to the garage. Um, but Adrian, you know, to me, I think the concern is clearing in 
in the riparian habitat area and the requirement that it would be need, uh, that, that permits from fish and wildlife are required and also Army Corps of Engineers. Um, could I just say, like, couldn't we just put some very simple language in there that if anything is to occur in that area, they must receive approval of the Fish and Game and Army Corps of Engineers? Exactly where I was going with this, okay. Commissioner Peak. Yes. Dennis, uh, is there any problem with doing that? No. Okay. Jeff? In, sorry. I'm sorry. I was looking at the LIP. I mean, John, you do, any issue with this? No, no problem as long as the, the uh, applicant is aware that not to go in there with it and to clear it out. So okay. what I'm trying to do is say, we can use language, let me try it. Um, and you correct me, Richard, if you wanna change it, uh, that uh, in any, uh, do we wanna just use the word riparian habitat or we wanna say 10 feet from the stream or, well. Say in the stream. In, in, the, in the stream bed. It includes repairing habitat too in the code. You, you use the word repairing habitat. That's that's okay, the term uh, that uh, the other agencies uh, will use. Uh, applicant will not clear in the repairing habitat or the or the stream without a permit from fish and game and any other federal state or federal agency that requires such permits. Fish and wildlife. Fish and wildlife. Commissioner Jennings, have you heard us? Um, yeah, no, I, that's fine. Okay. Um, Does that sound good to you, uh, uh, Patrick? I, absolutely. It, provided that we have that kind of clarified at the end in any other, you know, pertinent or any other applicable federal agency. So we're not okay. trying to box them in. Got it. Okay. That's my motion if Craig will accept it. Sure. Wait. Well, so hang on. So, so we, we, we had, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Mr. So I had put a motion that I had said, I'm, um, we can, let's add the language that says, if you're going into this stream, you got a, got agency approval. So are they both the same motion? Skyler? Okay. So my next question was, I think Craig had had some other comments. Yeah. Yes. So I didn't want to be okay. us going to a vote and shutting that off. But we I, we we could do a straw poll if you if you if Patrick if you want to just say that that's a a modification that we would looks like. Sure. So I mean at least at least what what, what I'm hearing in, in in my 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 mind is a friendly amendment from Vice Chair Mazza to Commissioner Peak's motion. I believe he indicated uh, acquiescence or acceptance of that, and so then it would go to Commissioner Jennings as the. Seconder of the motion to see if he accepts that friendly amendment. Yes, I do. Okay. But that, that I want to raise the same issue that Skyler did. Craig, have you got other issues on yeah. this case? Yeah, I have a couple of things that center around uh, view concepts, view concerns. One, back to the view from Canaan of this. Um, and, and, and the question of why is this not hillside development for the scenic visual and hillside resource protection ordinance? The question at, at the outset is, is, is there any language in the code that restricts the effects of any amount of view from a designated scenic road? Because um, chapter six of that uh, uh, 6.2 applicability quote, any parcel of land that is located along within provides views to or is visible from any scenic area road, public viewing shall be governed by the policies of this chapter. Um, it doesn't say, well, if you can only see a little bit of it and or if it's further away than a certain distance or as, as far as I know. And we just saw from the city council meeting uh, now two meetings ago in the case on the appeal on Doom Drive that uh, on the PVD there, any amount of view of those Santa Monica Mountains was significant and qualified. So I just wondered if there's any language on with respect to the Hillside Resource Protection Ordinance that says anything to the effect of, well, you know, it's it's got to be uh, visually impressive or significant amount or, I mean, it sounds to me like what we're looking at on here is, yes, you can see it from there, 
And yes, it is on slopes of two and a half to one or higher. And the ordinance applies. And so that would imply a house with a max height of 18 feet. It would imply a 25% reduction in the development area. Um, it would imply having to keep the overall height of the structure on the slope to 35 feet when it's now something like, I don't know, 45 or 50-ish. Uh, it, it would imply a completely different project, really. And it seems like we just kind of glossed over it unless there is some language that says, yeah, this, this view has to actually be very important uh, for this ordinance uh, to, to apply. This thing's in the canyon. What are you talking about? You're acting like it's right in front of you. And it's I'm, not... I'm acting like you can see it from Cane and Doom Road. You can here. see a lot of things from Cane and Doom Road. Yeah, absolutely. So it's also on two and a half slopes. And so uh, where is the discretion in the code? This this talks about this is uses the words is visible from any any parcel of land located in, a, in any scenic area or published shall be governed by the policies. Where is the wiggle room that says, eh, this isn't really significant, so we don't have to apply this law? I think that the wiggle room comes in precedent. And I think that well, there's a, that that might be the answer. I, I think that that's kind of how that's kind of how I look at this. Um, you have a lot of houses that are in this very area. Some which have been approved maybe recently, some of which have been there for a long time. And Indeed. I don't see, I think it's important when we look at view to look at things that are, you know, it's not on the top of a ridge line. It's not the highest house up on the road, you know, nor is it the lower house because there's some houses maybe low in that area. But as you come down the canyon, some of the other houses can, are going to get lower um, as the elevation gets lower. So, I mean, the way that I guess, Craig, I'm hearing what you're saying. I could be driving anywhere as I'm kind of being down Canaan. And if the house that's on the flat part of Point Doom would have an impact on my view, then it should be reduced and everything else. And I, I don't think that well, that's. It, but but it's on the flat part. It's not on a hill. Well, so. there's hills all over the point. Two, so, two, but but two and one. Yeah. I don't think that I don't think that that was written in a way where this was to apply to this project the way that I see it and the way that it looked at when I went up there and looked at it. So Adrian, I'm just putting that out there. What, what does Adrian have to say? He's got his hand up. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, I, I, I have a, I have the, the answer. I think uh, um, um, uh, hopefully uh, answers this question. So um, while the project does include construction on slope steeper than two to one um, that construction uh -oh. is for the driveway uh, the rest of the development the rest of the development is on areas flatter than uh three to one um or, or flatter than 30 percent um the 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 reason that the hillside standards um in the municipal code did not apply is uh twofold one is um, the the um, slope analysis that's required in the municipal code is uh, to use uh, ten foot contour lines, which is different from the five foot contour lines that we use for just developing on slopes. Um, with ten foot uh, slopes, um, the the you know the the area that we're you know the mounts that we're talking about uh, flattens out. And um, even that disappears. But in hang, hang, hang on, the slope analysis itself mm -hmm. shows areas of two and a half to one directly under the house itself. It's not just the driveway. The driveway is steeper than that. Right, my my internet just is not cooperating with me today. Um, I think I heard that the color coded slope analysis shows two and a half to one under the house. There, there are strips of two and a half to one under the house. Again, those are based on five foot contours, but the the majority. I'll I'll take a look. I thought I thought there wasn't anything under the house, but there might be, like you said, maybe a strip or or two. But um, specifically, the 
the municipal code, um, as it pertains to hillside standards, it uh, states to use 10 foot contours. So those slivers you're seeing would disappear uh, as you make the, you know, as, as you, as you use 10 foot contours instead of the five foot contours that are typically used uh, for construction on slopes. Or, or the three different slivers would average into at least one sliver at a 10 foot contour. But they're, they're gonna disappear. Uh, we, we, uh, that we're, that's just a presumption. So I don't know. It, it, it is, and we can uh, perhaps uh, get that data. Um, we, we didn't get the data, obviously, as we just found out last week that um, the property was visible from Canaan Doom. So um, up to that point, uh, we were not aware that this was visible. Uh, and in fact, I went to the site a few times and could not see the house from Canaan Doom. Um, but um, if, if that is something that the commission would like us to do, we can bring the analysis about that. Now, regarding the road itself, um, uh, the road and the fire department turnaround is excluded from the construction on slopes uh, uh, steeper than 30% 30, 30 yeah. when um, uh, establishing whether hillside standards apply. Right, yeah, that's right. Okay, so we, we have that point kind of hanging out there. I don't know if you'll necessarily we'll get any votes on that, but um, why, why don't I also just mention about the PVD? Uh, I think there's a view issue there. Um, didn't get the last of my paper here. Um, the, 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 here, the, we have language on the, the primary view in the PVD ordinance that refers to visually impressive, right? And it also, in this case, what would be blocked by this house to the neighbor who has the PVD is a valley, a canyon valley or ravine. They don't see the very bottom of the ravine, but they see the flank of it. And the, this house would block the flank. And one of the criteria listed for what does constitutes visually impressive is in 1745040 criteria E, the extent to which the primary view contributes to the economic value and or enjoyment of the claimant's property. And to my mind, putting this house here would definitely, uh, and blocking that bit of ravine there, would definitely lower the value of this house. Um, it, it's an impact on their view. And it, I don't think it's sufficient to say, well, it's not blue water or it's not uh, pristine Esha, something, whatever. Um, it, it, it qualifies to the extent that you think that there's any economic impact in, in when that view is reduced. And maybe that's a point of discussion. Uh, you wanna just say, well, you know, maybe that reduces the value of the house by a hundred thousand dollars, but it's a $10 million house or whatever. So who cares? I don't know. Skyler. Go ahead. Commissioner. The so Richard, the person that came and had the city do the PVD, did after seeing the photo and whatnot and how that laid out in the good question the site plan lines. Good question. Did they object to where the house was or no? Because it clearly from the photo, it's not blocking any of their ocean view. Correct. Yeah, I, yeah, I can ask the question. Um, yeah, we we did meet with the property owner across the street. Um, there were a number of revisions made to this house, um, just so that everyone knows. Um, the they pushed the house closer to the road, and there was a an element on that uh, upper level that uh, originally was. Uh, very close to obstructing blue water or may have obstructed some blue water and they revised that as well. Um, when I met with the neighbor across the street, um, and this is mentioned in the staff report, um, uh, the 
the neighbor's husband had just passed away and he was the one objecting to this project originally. Um, she still uh, had some reservations uh, about the project and uh, was going to contemplate whether to object to the project officially or not. And then um, I heard from the applicant that they had a conversation with the neighbor and that the neighbor um, said she wouldn't object to this project provided there wouldn't be any additional changes to it uh, that would further affect her view. Okay. I, I guess sort of what I, what I hear in, in that is that some of this has been worked out as to what those objections were. And that's, you know, through the multiple revisions that have been done. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. So Craig, with what you're saying in regards to the views and values and all that stuff, I don't think that anyone can dispute that if you had a, you know, property and you have views all over, you have 365 degree, you know, you can see <laughs> 360 degrees around you. All of a sudden the house pops up, right? That's blocking part of that view. That's going to impact a property, right? Similarly, though, you have a street like this, you have a fire burnout. out. There's a couple more houses that are developed. You have a nice, you know, new project that's coming into the neighborhood, a nice well-built house at the end of the day that can also increase the value, whether or not it had the impact on small or in part on someone's view. I think the, the biggest impact that I would say that I ever understood in this community and having been on council when some of that, some of those things were done is you care about looking at the ocean and you care about looking at the Santa Monica mountains. Yeah. And those are, I think the things that us as a body ought to put the most value on and really recognize that in, because that also establishes for the community and for other people that are coming forth with projects, kind of where the parameters are. And I think that in this situation, they architect designs a project they hear some concerns from the neighbors. They One of the neighbors goes through the primary view determination. The project changes, and it changes in a way that allows it to better fit in before it comes to us, which I think is the right thing to do. Absolutely. But I think I think what we've just heard is that there has been some accommodation, some back and forth, but there's still some residual concern on the part of the, the view owner. So. And, and look, if that person still you know has a tremendous amount of concern to that, and we elect to move forward with the project, they can always appeal that to the council and raise those concerns. Yeah. But, but you know, like, you know, I think we, we just, we need to know that. And that should be, we try to resolve as many things as we can here, but we can't always resolve everything. Yeah. Uh, can I comment? Vice Chair Mazza. Um, this is in a fire burnout area. When was the view determination made? Was it made after 2018? Yeah, the primary view determination was recently done. I want to say uh, end of February. So it's my understanding that in the in the uh, Wolsey Fire area, you may not may not have a view determination. I think that was just Malibu Park, though. I, I Jeff will know. Everywhere that was Wolsey, is there is there an answer to that? Jeff, yes. wasn't that just Malibu Park? We, uh, we, we. Have I been... don't remember it being limited to specifically to Malibu Park, but I'm not on staff, so staff can tell you. It, it's not limited to the the Malibu Park, or mm. you know, it's just limited to the fire affected areas, uh, okay. wherever well, those could be. So but, in this case, we're talking about something that's moot. They cannot have a. Well, well, um, the reason for that um, provision was. Uh, because people uh, were requesting primary views uh, for view preservation purposes uh, once um, most of the landscaping was burned out as a result of the fire. However, as a, a matter of policy, we have been processing primary view determinations, and we had a few of those uh, come to the Planning Commission before. Uh, and in and, and, uh, and, and the Wolsey zone? Uh, where, the, where the proposed development, right? Actual development is obstructing views. 
uh, then we do the primary determinations for that, and we still uh, bring those issues to the commission, and you know uh, those are part of the decision. Well, uh, I, I, this is a question uh, for Patrick. I mean, this is the second time under this discussion we're talking about actions by the city council that said, number one, you can't get a view determination in the Wolsey zone. It didn't say unless staff figures you can. And in the case where Craig read the law about uh, the hillside ordinance and staff said, well, we can determine what that means. And Craig read it and it said, shall, must, et cetera, et cetera. Does, and this is a question for Patrick, does, this, does the planning commission have the ability to change council passed items? Uh, thank you very much, Vice Commissioner Maza. Before I get that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Director Malika. He did have some thoughts on this first. I agree. Thank you. I believe the ordinance that's coming into question here is, I want to say 495. I, I'm, I'm probably wrong. I haven't looked it up. But it, it the exact wording is that a pause was put on primary view determinations when they were in fire affected areas, meaning that the view was over fire affected parcels. And so we have been, as Adrian mentioned, processing uh, requests for PVDs. And when we get those, what we do is we look to see what's in the PVD. And, you know, is this a situation where a house is now looking out over a, a, a a blank landscape because and by that I mean buildings and landscaping because it was all removed by the fire and in the case of this property it the the properties yes the the property to the uh west of it uh north and west that that's a burnout and uh, also the property that is on the um the immediate uh east side of it is burned out but beyond that it's a ravine and then on to Canaan and uh, you're looking then at, at Point Doom. So it does not appear that a PVD in this area would have be affected by the fire. And that that's why it took place. Well, and, let, me, let me ask you this. 43 houses burned down on Point Doom. Okay. Uh, houses burned down on uh, Galahad below it. Houses burned down on... Cavalry to the right of it. Done. The house burned down right next door to it. I know. I I, I, I understand the issue of what you're saying. I don't. I just don't see that the PVD that's been done in this situation is going to change any of this based on what's in front of us. No, I'm just trying to follow precedent. We had a house on Heathercliff, or off of Heathercliff, some little cul-de-sac, where staff allowed the, the people that own the house to move the second floor and block the view of the people behind them. And staff said, nope, they can't get a view determination. There's a, there's, and, but there were no houses in front of them other than that house that got burned down. So we have to be consistent. If we tell one person you can't have a view determination, what I'm saying here is this is moot. There's no view determination. We can't, it, it, it's, I do not believe that the city council passed an ordinance saying in a fire affected area, you can't have view determinations, but left it up to staff what was fire affected. And in this case, we have bunches of houses in the neighborhood burning down. So uh, that expires on June 30th, I assume, with everything else. But in the meantime, we shouldn't even be talking about view determinations here. Great. So let's stop right now. Yeah, I, I, I would say I would say I hear there are three yes votes here somewhere, and I have like three more points I would like to just get on the record, and if somebody wants to talk about them, great. But I think I you know I just like to at least put them on the table. Uh, ready? Number one is um, two thirds rule. Second story is as big as on, on the garage. Uh, is as big as the garage. It's basically a two-story box. Um, you can see that on sheet A3.1. 
A1.1, A1.2. Um, and it, it leads me to the thought that if just conceptually, if I was designing a house and I had my two thirds rule is maxing out, could I just expand my three car garage to a four car garage? And that would allow me to add more on the second story? Yes. Okay. Um, uh, point, penult penultimate point, the site plan review. Um, we have the height here and neighborhood character. And I don't see that we have any exhibits showing other houses in the vicinity over 18 feet. I'm sure there are some, but uh, I don't know what the proportion is. I don't know if it's, you know, most of them aren't over 18 feet or what the, I feel like if we're going to be doing the site plan review, we should have the uh, the exhibits and the, and the data in front of us to make that determination. And then finally, uh, on the rooftop deck, I just wondered, do the immediate neighbors know about this? And the, the answer is probably no, because they're burnouts. And so now it looks like they're going to come back and find their new neighbor looking down on them from, from the platform, from above. I just feel like there's, there's something inequitable about that with all the issues that rooftop decks have in terms of privacy. We're setting up a potentially problematic situation here when those re those rebuilds who, you know, they, those people ha have an, an investment in that neighborhood and that character already, they're going to come back and find somebody, you know, looking down in on them. I don't know that that uh, we've handled that well. Uh Craig, following up sort of on what you said, um, Richard, have you or Adrian or anyone at planning heard anything from the neighbor who's burned out? So we did hear from them, um, I want to say about a year and a half ago. Um, this was before the house was moved uh, closer to the road. Um, the owner at the time was objecting to the location of the house and they wanted it to be more in line with, with their house. Uh, since then, uh, that property owner has sold the house or the property to a new buyer, and the new buyer is currently pursuing the redevelopment of that property plus 10%. Are, are they aware of the rooftop deck specifically? Uh, I They never reached out to me, uh, but the the notice went out to everyone within 500 feet, so I'm sure they were notified, um, but um, they never reached out to me, so I don't I don't, I don't believe they are aware of the deck, perhaps. But we also don't know that they could have looked at this, you know. Uh, do we know, do we have in our resolution, our standard protections for the neighborhood for rooftop decks, dark sky, time of closing, et cetera, et cetera? Or no big, it, no uh, big uh, overnight objects. Uh, we, we do not have those conditions, but if the commission would uh, would have us at those conditions, we can certainly do that. Well, just, I have a motion. Adrian, just a, a question on those conditions, or uh, or Richard, either one. Are we not applying those universally to any rooftop deck, or is that project specific? Maybe Richard can answer the question. As far as I know, they are custom conditions, uh, project specific. Uh, just uh, at the last, though, the last time we heard one, we asked staff to come up with standard language so we could use it not to reinvent it each time. And uh, then we could tweak that rather than try to have a whole bunch of different ones. I assume they have done that. Um, so the, uh, but again, we need to, this is a light issue and a noise issue for a neighborhood, which is a fairly quiet neighborhood. The, the the house, the whole project's going to be subject to dark sky ordinance. So I don't correct Richard. Yes. And that should, that should alleviate those concerns. For, I'm so looking at, if, and that's conditions uh, 14 through 20. Okay. So I don't of, have a, no, that's only dark sky. There's other conditions. There's correct, other, I, I don't have issue with us imposing conditions on the rooftop deck but i just i think it's more of like a policy thing so we stop having to waste like time on this that we ought to figure out something that 
you know, we come up with that's sort of universal for that. Well, just don't have to waste that. time on it. We could have done that, Commissioner Peep. You can't leave umbrellas up. The lights have to be off. You can't have things above the handrail. We kind of well, have that already. Yeah, we have the standard language. And okay, so is that, but I thought that that was just not implemented on this, or did yeah, I misunderstand yeah. that? Commissioner Jennings, go ahead. Well, I just the, the limitation was if those remaining objects would be above the permitted height. Uh, if if I, I'm looking to find out where the deck is on this particular project, um, and it may be maybe the maybe the architect could help me out. Um, it, it may be that it's not required in this particular project. If I could find the deck. Well, Mr. while you're looking, uh, A4, A4.1. The thing that's problematic, Skylar, is it's more than dark skies. It's uh, view. It's also noise, uh, et cetera. I, I, no, I, I very much understand that. That's why, that's why I'm just, you know, raising the question of if, so that we don't have to put all these things on it every time. Right. So at the last year. I, that's all I'm saying. I don't think that we have an issue with agreeing on what they can be, but I don't want to waste an hour doing that right now. No, no. And the last hearing we had on decks, we asked staff to come to formulate a standard paragraph we could use. And I'm sure they've done that. And I would like to put an amendment in, uh, a friendly amendment to use staff standard language. So, so like you're asking for this to be written up and brought back to us for approval then. Well, they, they, we asked them to have it ready so we could read it into the record if they do have it ready. Um, Chairman Smith. Go ahead. Uh, Adrian, I'm looking at 4.1. Uh, and what I see, the deck I see appears to be uh, on the sort of southeast portion of the of the uh, home. Is it? I'm right above some some windows. Is that the deck we're talking about? Yeah. So sheet A dash three point one. Uh, if you look at that cross section, that shows it better. It's a small uh, rooftop deck. Yeah, that's accessible only to that. Um, I think it's going to be used as a somewhat of a of a guest house area up on top of um, the garage. And uh, that's I think that's less than 18 feet right there. Uh, well, th it will be over. It's right at 18 or excuse me, it's right at the height limit um, where the railing is. So any furniture above the railing uh, would likely be over the height limit. So we can we can certainly add a condition about um, deck furniture not to exceed the the height uh, of 28 or whatever, 24 feet for flat or 28 uh, eight feet for I, pitch. I don't think the table and chairs and all that's always just been like umbrellas and stuff that we can't. Yeah, we're about, talking about fixtures, yeah. furnitures and fixtures. But and potted bombs, all that stuff. Yeah. That's in but our language, this is, I believe. I, I believe our language says above 18 feet. And, well, uh, and we're granting the site plan review here on this one, are we? Well, there we're, is we're, site plan review. What Skyler's saying and what I'm saying is we're, we've tried to come up with standardized language uh, to cover everything. And, for example, uh, the dark sky says string lights must be have, have, um, uh, monitors with a motion. It doesn't say you can't put in a hundred non-string lights. You know, it, it's but the way our, as I remember our uh, our uh, provisions for rooftop decks, with they must be light censored, and uh, uh, once somebody's gone for ten minutes, they have to shut off. It doesn't. Right. It has to be a string light. There's there's little things a way to get around things that people use. Um, I don't I, think that we're I, I, let's 
get to the point where we can wrap this one up because otherwise we're not going to get through the agenda tonight. And I think that's just like, well, if we could get that language, do you have that language, Richard, or is it something we should bring, have brought back? Or can we say, but John, the other part of this is, you know, we can't just be like making up language without having like, you know, an ordinance from the city council saying, Hey, look, no, 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 we need to follow this language, language when it comes Skyler, to roof decks. Skyler, we make resolution language on almost every yeah. thing we discuss. Yeah. Okay. Well, but but it, want, that I'm raises it out there. Commissioner raises Davis. a point that that we have done this because of neighbors' concerns and so forth. But the issue has always been there's nothing in the in the, that the city council has done to prohibit or control or regulate these rooftop decks at all. Well, that's why I asked Patrick, which I never got an answer on. Do we follow the city council's words if they pass them? Okay, can we change them? And we're Sorry, changing them all yeah. the time. Sure. So, Vice Chair Moza, I believe the question you had asked me dealt with the primary view determination in the in in the Woolsey fire and, and direct that, that, that's right, so, the, that No, I, I I specifically I'm after what Craig brought up is the hillside ordinance is very specific. It said you shall you this you that, and then we get today we get. Planning commissioner saying, yeah, but, you know, I don't care about a canyon or whatever else. It does not say that in the law, so in the ordinance. So are we allowed to change ordinances? So if the if the planning commission does not believe that this project complies with the pertinent or various ordinances, either addressed by Commissioner Hill or or or, or anyone else for that matter, you guys, of course, are in that decision to 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 voice that. But if you're, I, I, if you're going to ask me the question, can the planning commission make law and basically ignore direction from city council in the form of a of a of an ordinance? Vice Chair Mazza, no. I, of course, I'm going to say no. However, I do not believe that that, that is the instance in, for 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 this project before you, or else staff wouldn't be recommending it. Our office our office would not have reviewed it and cleared it. So. I know you, oh, okay. you can ask a hypothetical in regards to this project, which is a tough, tough question. To oh, no, I'm not. This is not a hypothetical. When an ordinance says you shall, not you can, or you may have a variance, it says you shall, and we shan't, or whatever you want to say, we just say, ah, oh, forget that. To me, that is not legal, and that's my question. We aren't so, authorized when they use. So, so sure, yes, I will. I will, I will say that, that that typically in in the rules of statutory interpretation, shall is mandatory and and and, and may is permissive. Okay, that's good enough for me. So, uh, Dennis, we were listening to um, uh, Commissioner Hill's additional comments, and he raised three, and that that exhausts your your concerns. Then, Craig. Uh, Yes, except to point out that we're talking about is there council authority for limiting things on roof decks? And I would say, yeah, the, we have the whole series of sections in the general plan about uh, privacy that I've called out before. And I, I have written up on a sheet here to have handies whenever we talk about these things. So it's not like we're we're making this up without authority. There, There is a basis to it. But on, on that note, I'm I'm... I, I will close my ledger. Okay, I'm gonna let's we can do this. Uh, Rebecca's got her hand up. Uh, Ms. Evans, go ahead. I just was going to state that the condition, I believe, uh, the commissioners were referring to in the last time that we adopted such a condition, stated nothing left overnight on the proposed rooftop deck may exceed 25 feet in height, as measured from the existing lowest finished floor elevation. That was for a house, and then and then it included the specifics because that was a beachfront standard. That no, sounded like that was from a house on PCH down yeah, by the no, Lost Forest. It was. It was. When we did it, it was a house uh, on sea level, or the one after that. Uh, it was the one. It was on land. Okay. Well, what 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 if any of that stuff do we need to apply here? Nothing. The, the umbrellas right. come down. You can't leave that kind of thing up. Everything. It's got to be flat. If your chair sticks above the railing, I'm not sure that that really causes any grief. It's really umbrellas. And and if people have lights strung everywhere, 
I don't believe they can do that either. So, okay, so um, really, we kind of have a thing. All right, so all of that question, language. Skyler, all... it, it basically said, and the reason for the 25 feet is the beach, but uh, it, it said uh, you may not leave any furniture or, or anything above, movable above 18 feet. Or, I got it. And, and it must be light monitor. A uh, motion sensor monitor to where 10 minutes after it's vacated, the lights shut off. Correct. There was a couple other things uh, about what time of night you could, you had, had to shut off. You couldn't have a party till four. Uh, I think it was 11. This is language we worked out and uh, either Adrian or Richard can say whether or not it ever got Put into we asked okay. to make a standard thing. If they don't have a standard thing, I recommend they come back with a standard thing so we don't have to do this over and over and over again. Okay. So again, I just asked specifically to Richard as whether or not this language is included in the existing resolution. Yes or no. No, the rooftop deck in terms of leaving materials out, um, that is not. Uh, the dark skies provisions are, are about lights being turned off at specific hours, that of course has been included. Um, if the commission would like, uh, yes, I believe it was a uh, sea level drive house. Uh, we can incorporate the conditions as mentioned, uh, by, I believe it was uh, Chair Smith, which had to do with uh, the prohibition on leaving out items overnight that exceed eight, that would exceed- Exceed eight. the height of the rail. Okay. Yeah. It, it, Commissioner Jennings, go ahead. Yeah, I'm looking at 4-01B. <laughs> and if that's the deck I'm seeing, it looks like it's on the top of the garage. And it's mainly, that there there is a building to the right of it, right? Everybody got the page I'm looking at? Yeah, for, it was on. Up on the top. See, the question is, you know, we we say rooftop deck like we you know like uh i'm not i wouldn't call that a rooftop deck are we going to apply these rules to every deck uh you're just going to call this one a deck I'm, i, I, I could offer I'm some concerned. clarity i think there's a difference between a balcony versus a, t a deck that covers a whole roof area and to me the the main concerns given that we have dark sky already is noise is the, the the noise factor so 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 how 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 wide a deck is prohibited or it comes no. under constraint and if it's a narrow deck i mean we're gonna is it gonna be eight feet ten feet twenty feet where are we gonna go with i it? think it's hard to make a specific rule because every case is different but but uh, in terms of noise it's it's a big difference if you have you know ten people on a on a balcony and the party that it can make versus a whole roof with you know a hundred people on it well, I, I think we're, we're making problems for ourselves. I, I would recommend one. I would recommend that we direct staff to include the language on the sea level property and bring the item back to us for approval and uh, if approve that language, and then we can be done with it. And then hopefully, when they come back, they'll come back with language we can use over and over and over again well personally i would not apply those the same strictures that we've applied in other cases to this deck it's it's a small tiny deck above a above a garage and um so i wouldn't support that well but, we can um, we can have a definition have staff come up later with a definition I, of what a deck is i would i would love to have staff come back with a a, a list of of uh restrictions we could impose in an appro in appropriate cases whether it's an appropriate case or not is something that we're going to have to decide i think on a case-by-case -case basis like yes. a menu well hopefully you have one or two standard paragraphs so we don't have to go through this every time and then so, we can decide is it a rooftop deck or isn't it okay um i i do not want to add the friendly amendment in regards to the uh deck stuff i don't think it's necessary here so you don't want to have any restrictions on that deck. 
No, I don't, based on okay. how the, the drawings that I just looked at. So hang on. So, Mr. Donegan, where are we as far as our motions and all that kind of stuff? We we need to move here. So we, we have a, a original motion by Vice, Vice Chair Maza, seconded by Hill. We then had a substitute motion by Commissioner Peak and seconded by Commissioner Jennings, who did accept the friendly amendment regarding the any clearance in the right, and once again, this is not verbatim, I believe Richard has it, any clearance in the right riparian habitat area must re, uh, receive approval from all pertinent and applicable federal agencies. And that has been the only amendment, uh, uh, friendly amendment accepted by Commissioner Peak and Commissioner Jennings. Okay, and that would be the roll call we would take first, am I correct? That is correct, Chair Smith. Sure, we have a roll call. Commissioner Peak. Yes. I'm, Commissioner, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I didn't hear what this vote, this one is on. Apologies. So this it's is. This, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, I'm go sorry. Back. Go ahead. So, so it's on. It's on Commissioner Peak's motion, which is staff recommendation, with an accepted friendly amendment regarding any clearance in the riparian habitat must receive approval from any and all pertinent and applicable federal agency. Got it. Thank you. Okay, back to the vote. Um, go ahead. Okay. So, uh, Commissioner Peak. Yes. Commissioner Jennings. Yes. Commissioner Hill. No. Vice Chair Mazza. No. Chair Smith. Yes. Motion carries. Okay, let's take a minute, you guys. Five minutes. Back. Five. Eight forty. Eight forty-six. Eight forty-seven. Yeah, I'm I'm fading a little bit here, but uh, I'll I'll hang in as long as I can. Have you taken your temperature? Yeah, uh, yeah. I tried to tell you before. I I have about a one degree, and oh. you know I figure you know unless it gets worse, there's going to the emergency is kind of crazy. Yeah, I just but I want you to know. see you expire in front of us. You know? No, <laughs> <laughs> I'll go off screen to do that. All right. I do know your address yeah, yeah. though. And please make sure to turn off the camera and the mic, please. Thank you.
Chair Smith, I'll have my video turned off, but I am back in the meeting whenever you're ready to continue. Your video is on. Yeah, I was just letting the chair know that I'm present in the meeting um, again after recess and available when the rest of the commissioners are present. Well, I like seeing you, Rebecca. Likewise. We got, oh, Commissioner Hill. Nobody's at the east end, so we don't know if there's any ambulances going. He's he's on the site. I don't see if he. What happens? It, can you turn his camera on and see if he's there? <laughs> he has to do that. Hang on, yeah. I, I I don't think we should, if we can, remotely turn on anyone's camera. <laughs> I don't <laughs> believe we can anyway. Yeah, Good. we're we're just the planning that commission uh, vice chair, not the CIA. Okay, we'll wait. <laughs> we're not New Yorker magazine. <laughs> Michael Cohen. Uh. Do we wait just like one minute and then we have enough people to get started? Yeah, Chair, I, I think that would be fine at your discretion, particularly too, since Commissioner Hill did indicate he may not be back. I guess, Rebecca, if you have his phone number, we can text him and or email him. But if not, then yes, Chair Smith, it's, it's your up to you. All right. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and get started here since we're we're at 8.52. So we're on uh, new public hearings. We're on 5A, Coastal Development Permit number 21-065. Site plan review number 21-036, lot line adjustment number 21-003, lot merger number 21-001, and demolition permit number 21-035. Application for a remodel of an, an application of a remodel in addition to an existing single family residence, new detached garage, lot line adjustment, lot merger, and associated development. Mr. Senior Planner Eaton, it's all yours. Thank you. Good evening, Chair Smith and members of the Planning Commission. The next item tonight is, as mentioned, a CDP for a remodel, lot merger, and lot line adjustment. Next slide. Um, the three parcels involved in this application are 9049 Cliffside, Cliffside Drive, which will be referred to as Lot A. Uh, 7140 Grasswood Avenue, which will be referred to as Lot B, and 29055 Cliffside Drive, which will be referred to as Lot C. Uh, the three parcels are all north of Cliffside Drive in the Point Doom neighborhood. Next slide. Uh, the project proposes the following. It's an interior exterior remodel of the existing residence on Lot A, uh, resulting in 38.2% of exterior, exterior walls being demolished. There's demolition and addition of second floor area resulting in 40 square in a 40 square foot reduction of the existing square footage of the single family home. There's the demolition of the existing two car garage on lot A, a new 700 square foot detached garage with rooftop terrace and exterior stairway on what is now lot B. Um, a remodel of the existing set shed structure on lot A. There's outdoor lighting in compliance with the dark sky ordinance and a new permeable driveway and access way from Grasswood Avenue. There are lots, uh, new lots being proposed in this application. The project involves a lot line adjustment between lots A and C, uh, a lot merger between A and B. Uh, the newly proposed parcels one and two um, uh, 
I'm sorry. Uh, the, there are also two discretionary requests proposed for this application, a site plan review for construction up to 25 feet in height for a pitch roof and a demolition permit uh, for the demolition involved with the single family residence and also the existing uh, detached garage. Next slide. So as mentioned, the project proposes uh, the lot merger of lots A and B as shown here. Um, there's also a lot line adjustment between lots A and C. The lot merger indicated to the right as the newly created parcel one will result in a parcel that will meet the lot development criteria of the NMC for the rural residential one acre zone. The newly created parcel two will absorb the Flagstaff portion of the existing lot A. Uh, parcel two will still be non-compliant, uh, particularly with the 150 foot minimum lot width, uh, but the size, it will come closer to compliance with the size requirements. Uh, parcel one will gain its new access from Grasswood Avenue. Next slide. Uh, so here's the proposed site plan. As mentioned, uh, there will be a proposed remodel and a second story addition to the existing single family residence <clears throat> and a new detached garage. The existing shed will be remodeled with in-kind windows and doors and a re-roof. Uh, there's no proposed demolition for the shed. Uh, there's also a new driveway and a fire department turnaround proposed uh, to the north of the parcel here uh, via Grasswood Avenue. And all of the construction will take place on parcel one. Next slide. The second story addition to the main home will be a maximum of 25 feet above grade. And as such, the applicant is requesting a site plan review for development over 18 feet. Uh, there is no public or private protected views uh, anticipated to be impacted, uh, which will also be discussed a little later on here. Next slide. The new detached garage with rooftop deck and exterior staircase will be 14 feet above grade, and, and that includes the safety rail. Next slide. The next few slides here demonstrate view impacts via the installed story poles. This slide here shows a south facing view. Uh, the proposed height is in line with existing and the applicant chose to design the pitch in a way that uh, mimics the existing conditions. Next slide. This here is an east facing photo. Next slide. Uh, this photo here is from Cliffside Drive. <clears throat> no impacts are anticipated from scenic areas. <clears throat> Next slide. Uh, story poles of the garage here, just kind of a square shape. Next slide. Um, so there was some concern kind of as, as well as I heard in, in the last item about the proposed rooftop deck and the garage and the potential uh, above the garage and the potential lighting impacts. So this project is conditioned to comply with dark sky ordinance at all times. However, the commission can consider additional conditions related to this one, which was placed on a on a recent project, which further limits lights on the, the rooftop deck. Uh, you can also um, consider other issues uh, that are raised with rooftop decks. Next slide. The recommendation is to approve the project as conditioned, and uh, we are available for any questions. Okay, thanks, sir. Uh, back to us, disclosures. Uh, Vice Chair Mazza. I uh, sent a series of questions to Tyler and had a discussion about he He answered those adequately, and I had a discussion with him about um, grasswood parking, uh, which was a gen which I'll bring up in the uh, general discussion. Commissioner Peak. I visited the site and met with the uh, Elaine, the architect, and with the owner, and I didn't learn anything other than seeing it in person uh, than we've discussed so far this evening. Commissioner Hill, I see you're here. I didn't know I was gone. Um, I looked at 3D modeling of it. Other than that, didn't learn anything new, no disclosures. Commissioner Jennings. Done. I too went there and saw Elaine and Cynthia, a wonderful person. What a piece of property. Oh my God, is that thing terrific. 
so this is a this is a pretty sweet setup but they her, she got there in 83 and and they hung on they've hung on she's hung on to that that whole thing it's nice okay um oh well, let's see we'll go to uh, uh public, public, public opinion staff report staff report oh, oh we, we just had it i'm sorry we, we've, we've had, had this uh, yep sorry we, and, I, and, yeah, I, just just off there. I just wanted to note for the record commissioner hill you you were there for the entirety of the staff report correct you heard it i might have missed the first 10 seconds or something but i don't i don't know nothing substantive thank yeah, you yeah, yeah. okay um, and I apologize, we do have some background sound with the custodial group at the moment. Um, Elaine Renee Weissman, Nicholas Blondin are both from ERW Design, and the owner Cynthia Schott and Mindy and Paul Peterson are all available to respond to questions and reserve the right for a rebuttal should a member of the public wish to speak in opposition. No one has signed up in advance of the meeting. If you're present in the meeting and would like to speak on this item, please click the raise hand button at this time. And seeing none. Okay, that closes the public opinion, public hearing, and now we're to us. And of course, Vice Chair Mazza, go ahead. Well, I don't necessarily want to be first uh, if anybody else wants to. Um, I have two issues and one. In general, there's no problem with the property. When I looked at the uh, plans, there appeared to be easements on it, which the applicant has confirmed have already been taken care of. So there's no problem uh, there. Uh, one problem I see and I think we need to, to address this, and that is they're putting in a new entrance on, on Grasswood uh, with a new driveway and new gate. And uh, site plan shows uh, encroachments into the public right-of-way. And normally on Point Dune, we kind of look the other way, but this particular street is in the bullseye of hundreds of residents and the Coastal Commission, and it's already cost the city upwards of $4 million to fight this battle. And that is that Grasswood is a parking street per the Coastal Commission and per the agreement with the city council in 2010. So I would like us to include in the resolution a the requirement that encroachments into the public street and the public property be removed uh, because there's going to be a big battle over parking. And if we do not remove it, in my opinion, and the attorney can uh, come in on it, if Coastal comes in and demand it, then we're going to have to go and sue the applicant or something to remove it. So now's the time to take care of it. Um, if it were some inland street or something, it's a different deal, but this is ground zero right now on Point Doom, and you'll see all the VOPs up there every weekend and uh, the craziness that's going on. So uh, that's one thing I would like to recommend. The other thing is, uh, this is number one, it is viewable from a scenic road, a specific scenic road. So, and it is downslope from other houses. So I think we need to consider what conditions uh, the the um, rooftop deck gets. And uh, I asked Tyler this afternoon to dig up some of those conditions. They don't have to be all of them because this is a 14 foot deck with well, it's 18 feet when you add whatever, but uh, we need to consider the string lights. We need to consider sound. We need to consider shutoff time uh, because this is in a quiet neighborhood, downslope from houses above for light and an upslope from houses below for sound. So um, I, I would like to discuss that also. And I'd like to ask, uh, well, specifically, Tyler, to comment on those two items. Um, 
I, he, he was told me that he was going to come up with some language he'd used before on the rooftop deck. Uh, but first, uh, how we stand on encroachments into the city easement. Unless you don't want me to ask him now, you guys want to comment first and uh, ask other well, stuff. You've, you've asked the question, so we can see if we can get an okay. answer. Uh, Senior Planner Tyner, uh, uh, Eaton, or Director Malika, do you guys have an answer for that? I mean, they got to get an encroachment permit to put the gate. Um, I'm sure. I, I guess there's a parking issue over there. I don't. I'm not. I will be honest. I'm not that familiar. Uh, the gate, the whole opening, will probably be 20 feet for the fire department. So that's one car. So. Um, Hold on. The the project that you're referencing, there's currently all no parking in front of this house. So I don't see what the issue is that's being raised here, John. Well, according to our agreement, as I understand it with with the coastal this, commission, this portion of the coastal yeah, I can clarify. I can clarify. I go there uh, often on, on full moons to meet with friends on Point Doom to watch the moon rise. And Yes, the first part of Grasswood is no parking. It takes, I don't know, just past this lot is where it becomes free parking. That's correct. This is yeah. no parking. And the way that I see the drawing here, the um, the gate that is proposed is outside of the city's right-of-way. Oh, right. no, I have inside. no problem with the gate at all. I'm just okay. worried about having a problem with Coastal and on I don't particular street. And so I see no reason to encroach, number one, because it's never been used as a uh, entrance before. So? So <laughs> we're going to, according to what I've been told, we're going to have to come up with as much as 80 parking spots at Point Doom on that corner, that area. And I think it's behoo behooven upon us to protect the city. So are, are, are you saying that we should move the no parking sign that's currently? No, I'm not. I'm saying we should re remove encroachments on city property. Not but if the there are no encroachments on what's proposed, then what's the issue? There are encroachments. If you look at the, uh, if you look at A10, you see the foliage and all that junk. Yeah. So can I clarify? Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. please do. So, so um, there's a driveway apron that's proposed uh, from the right of way. Um, as far as the, the, the gate, uh, Commissioner Peak was correct. It's on the actual property um, that's proposed, but there's an existing fence and some vegetation that uh, is within the right of way that this property kind of uses as a, as a boundary. Um, so that's what I believe Comm uh, Vice Chair Mazza is referring to, uh, but it's existing. So they weren't, uh, them being having a less than 50% remodel, they weren't required to, um, you know, bring this anything into conformance, but I believe that's what you were referring to, right? That's what I'm referring to, but uh, the only time you are restricted from bringing things into conformance if it was permitted. This obviously was never permitted. But I have, so I, I just have like a, a comment on this, like in terms of following the contour lines and whatnot. The flat, the flat part that's up on Grasswood for this house is not necessarily, um, it's not very large, but it kind of follows. If you go to what it would be, maybe the the northeast side of the um, I'm on the or the uh, site plan uh, A one. The like, are we are we going to ask them to remove the chain link fence in its entirety? Or what I'm what I'm proposing is encroachments on city property be removed okay, so that would be the existing they are on city fence, property the existing chain link fence and potentially a small portion of vegetation yes okay can we have the applicant come on here um i have no problem or elaine i think the applicant's representative is um under the identity bernard renee yeah that's elaine right mm -hmm. Can, can we let her speak for a second? I have a question for her. It's not allowing me. Oh, uh, we can David, hear you now. We're hearing you can now. you hear me now? Yeah, I discussed this issue about the existing chain link fence and vegetation with the owner who's sitting next to me. 
and she is she has agreed to relocate the chain link fence and remove the vegetation so that's awesome the only thing that i think can potentially inhibit part of that and how that's set up is that the the topography of the land sort of drops off it if you go to the site plan on uh a1 yeah the lot kind of slopes down which would be the top of that page right and you go into that contour line where it's falling down and i just think that for the city well one for the property owner but also for the city it's probably in the city's best interest best interest to have that um fence that gets relocated to go kind of follow the elevation of where the road is and it's going to put it a couple feet on that end, potentially, into the city's right of way. Can I ask you a question? Why, why would you want the city would be liable for that as long as well as the owner? Would you want the city to be liable? It's not so much that I want the city to be liable for it, John. It's the fact that if all of a sudden we have a flat area of road and then we're dropping down three or four feet at one part for a fence that's only six feet high and impermeable above 42 inches, that that fence sort of becomes useless for the person's privacy. And we're talking about an area where we have all these people walking and parking. And and by the way, a lot of people park illegally in front of this lot right now, right? Yeah. Because it's it's one area that's vacant and the cars go there. I just think it's smarter to keep it up on that higher line. But if nobody or, wants to do that, or, or, that's fine. Or you could say the fence follows the edge of the pro the, the city the property line, but the the height of it can conform to the with respect to the road bed so that when that's fine down it could be a little bit taller in that one spot maybe or is that breaking the code well it's breaking the code you'd have to give a variance for that no, we yeah. give a variance. our commissioner jennings yeah what we've done in the past in situations like this is to just to make sure that the that the city is not permitting these encroachments into the public right-of-way in other words okay. they've, they've existed in the past that's fine that's on the landowner all we want to make sure is that we are not saying that's okay. That's not, that is not to be permitted. Okay. So, and then they can handle it however they want to handle it. Well, so, that's, that's somewhat true, except, so I, except the very next corner, Doom Drive and Cliffside Drive, we restricted the, the owner nothing on the city right away because of that very reason. And okay. because of the proximity to the park and uh so then we can we, we can resolve this by not i mean i think the question sort of been answered like we just they can put the fence in it has to go outside the city's right away and you guys are willing to make them allow her to make it tall enough so that it would become six feet off of whatever the height of the road is yes Okay, does does anybody have an issue with that? I don't have an issue. I don't know exactly what you're talking about, but I don't have an issue with it. How, how many feet would that be? Out of I, I don't know exactly what the I mean, contour line is. is. 20 feet or 50? No, it would be like, you know, Seven. 8 feet or 10 feet, okay. only at one that's, end. That's no problem at all. I'm just trying to eliminate problems for the landowner in the city. Okay. Over I just want, I want to make sure, too, that Elaine understands what I'm talking about. And that the homeowner understands what I'm saying. I want to understand what you're talking about. Well, no. So the 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 topography of the land. The, the no, no. The I get that part of it. How do you down. how do you how do you all of a sudden waive the restriction on fence height on the front boundary? I mean, variance. That's what I'm saying. Is but is there's the no variance applied for here, and right. that would require bringing this thing, sending it back and bringing it forward again. In okay, order to well, grant the variance. If that has to happen in the future, that has to happen in the future. But I'm just saying if yeah. we're going to have her, if we're requiring her to remove the fence that's in the city right away, right? My my option would be not to require her to remove it. To just say, we are not permitting it. It's not, it's not part of this project. 
And then if and, there are any issues, too. I don't know. Really it is part of this project. It is part of this project. They are creating a totally new entrance to the property. Either yes, they are. But so we're giving them a permit to do that. And we're giving them an encroachment permit to do that. The encroachment okay. permit is for construction of a driveway. It's the driveway. Yes, it's an encroachment permit, and uh, for the driveway, but not for the fence and not for anything else. That's okay, for so then we have to state in our motion the encroachment permit does not include any encroachment beyond the, the property fence. line. We, go. No, we don't. The, 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 the project, we would say the project does not include any of those improvements which may be outside of the property line, the, the, the boundaries of the property. Um, and that's it. It has, it has nothing to do really except that the two you, you use the, the word encroachment in both settings. An encroachment permit it just allows the work to be done on the public street in order to be able to build the driveway. But we're and that's fine. We can do that. But you don't you don't permit anything that's outside the property line. You just well, leave that for for whoever wants to fight over it. If she wants to move it, that is why I'm making the motion, or I'm going to make the motion, or I'm going to try to make the motion that. We, what we're after here is we've already spent over $12 million on this, fighting the Coastal Commission. And it looks like we're going to fight them again. And I'm trying to save the city money and the property owner grief. Okay. So hang on, now, Vice Chair. And, Vice Chair, let, let, my, let Senior Planner Eaton answer this. Yeah, thank you, uh, Chair. I was just going to, so uh, for a point of clarification, if, if, uh, and I just want to make sure the homeowner is aware, like uh, Commissioner Peake mentioned, that uh, I was saying that if if they do move the fence, they agree to that. Uh, one, are we saying that it doesn't have to comply because this would become a front yard fence, in which case they would lose uh, a bit of privacy uh, because I believe that the existing fence has a kind of a meshing, you know, up to six feet tall that gives them the privacy as of current day. Uh, but if we're looking at it as a new parcel and this being the front, uh, you know, the 42 inches solid would apply. And it is a new parcel. Yeah, unless we can get creative. New parcel is parcel one, not A and B. Oh, uh, Richard, Richard, correct me if I'm wrong. Could we say they can install a fence? Because in this case, as it gets in, it could be um, a side yard fence, and we could say, uh, the, 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 the fence can be installed prior to the new lot being created, in which case, you know, it's still a side yard fence. That's two CDPs. <laughs> Respect, let me ask you a question, Skylar. How We're much, getting awfully creative how, here. How much difference in height are you talking? I mean, I'm just going off of the contour map now, but having been there myself, I believe that on that side of the property, it, it becomes it drops off a little bit quicker. So I'm talking two feet, 10 feet, six feet. I'm you're talking about a couple feet, but I, I, I just wanted to make sure that the owner was aware, just like uh, how senior planner Eaton just described that currently the, you know, when that fence goes away, the new fence has to go further, you know, into the property because of where the city's right of way is. And then part of, part of that drops it down the hill lower. So if we want to say, you know, yes, we're not permitting anything in the city right away other than, you know, we're allowing them to get an encroachment permit for the driveway. And if they leave their old fence, that's fine. If they come in with a new fence, we deal with it at that time. That's fine. And I'm saying that causes legal problems for the city. But that's the owner could, proposing the, it. It's, it's a small thing to do, but if you study Point Doom and you know what's going on, I very, John, I very much understand what you're saying. So I was trying to kill two birds with one stone. I recognize that I can't entirely do that right now, but I would like to make a motion to approve the project as is, and those things can get dealt with later. How? Uh, well, she can either remove the fence if she wants to remove the fence, or she can come in with it and apply to build a new fence. Okay, I'm gonna. Uh, I'm, I have other questions. I I think, but just well, to comment, needs a second. I, I think problem. when you punt on a problem, we, there is no trying problem. to be efficient, and 
when you count on a problem and you're going potentially going to cost the city a whole bunch of legal fees, you should think about it. But it's not. It's, it's very not simple our, to it's solve. Not our right now. Commissioner what? Jennings. Commissioner Jennings, go ahead. I'm going to second the motion, but I want to ask staff if there's any way that we can memorialize the fact that we are not granting a permit for any of those improvements that are outside the property line. And I'm in total agreement with you on that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so that, that, that would include the driveway apron, right? I'm sorry? That would include the driveway apron? Because that's what's being proposed. And, uh, there's, there's, the... there's there's an apron that extends outside the property line. Is that what you're saying? Uh, well, yeah, that connects to uh, uh, Grasswood Avenue. Right. Yeah, Tyler, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, yeah. I'm looking at sheet. Yikes. Let me change pages here. Uh, the third sheet in. A10. A10. A10 or F1. Yeah, I think that that is a good one to use. Tyler, am I mistaken in that the only item that's in the right of way, and I also looked at the public works referral, is the driveway itself? Yes. It's it. There's no, so this approval would not uh, be retroactive to anything else that's currently existing or in that area. Correct. This is just the driveway, just a new driveway in her gate. And she drives down there because she's got no way to get, she's had all those years with her neighbor on the other side. This is a terrific <laughs> idea for her. No, I, that's <clears throat> that's great. As long as um, the, the, the implication kind of be, is raised because you show the vegetation that's there that, that encroaches and the fence that's there that apparently encroaches as well. Um, it, I would just like to make it clear that that's not part of this project and it's not being permitted. That's correct. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to make it clear and I'll make a motion on this after you vote on yours that they are encroaching. They have no permit to encroach and it should be removed since it's a new development. And because the reason for that is one block away, we did exactly the same thing. And very close to a park, which is under contention with the city. And there's no reason why the city should eat a bunch of legal fees because somebody encroaches. Can I, can I ask for clarification? What is encroaching? Because I'm looking at the... Uh, an aerial view on on Google right now, and 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 a street view, and there is plenty of room to park all along that fence, but for the fact that there are no parking signs. So, there's how how wide how much is that fence into the city right away? Because it it seems like, and and what how much more does the public need there exactly? Because if if you can park there, you you're good. Not according to the Coastal Commission. Well, we're not worried about them right now. All we're trying to do is... Oh, well, that's, that's the problem. Entrance. But that's, that's, that's the problem. But that's wait, a wait, hypothetical wait, wait. problem. Wait, wait. My, my question not is... hypothetical. Skylar, you're, you're, muted. you're muted. If you go to the topographic survey, which is yeah. the second page, you will see where the existing chain link fence is, and you will see where the city's right-of-way line is. Yeah, I can't read that. It's too small. Uh, the fence is like a chain... It's like... The fence is about five to 10 feet in from where the city's right of way is. Right. And then yeah, it's an A10 shows a bunch of foliage also. You're saying the fence has captured five feet of the width of the right of way. Yes. And if you look, if you go to the next page, which is the slope analysis, you can see it again there. Right. And, and the confusion, uh, Craig, is that the the right of way is the the easement right of way is not fully paved. It's it's one of those forty foot right of ways, probably right. Yeah, it's yeah. probably a fifty foot right of way, but it's twenty five uh, feet on her side of the street. Yeah, 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 um, twenty five. But as, as a practical matter, we could just treat it like it's something it, it's exi pre existing now, and and if in fact the coastal and, and the city have a, a dispute about what needs to happen there. 
who knows, maybe Coastal will say, yeah, what you need to do there is put in a retaining wall and put diagonal parking or something, but then that's on them later. You know, that's not- They, they couldn't require that because they'd be encroaching onto her property to do that. To actually perform it. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Uh, but this, I guess- this, this isn't in, in our purview right now. The only thing we're worried about is getting her down that driveway and getting a coach encroaching from Mitch from public works so she can drive in there. The rest of this has doesn't have anything to do with this tonight. So, so well, why do you say that? John, why John, do you my, say that? My because. question to you, John, John, what is the benefit or the effect or the significance of uh, moving the fence five or 10 feet away from where it is now, if people could actually park along that side, if the no parking signs were gone? But because because there's a bunch of additional parking spaces that are going to be created mm -hmm. some point in the future, mm -hmm. and we did it exactly the same way, one block away, and but these spaces it's public in, property. You the don't spaces exist. Away public property unless you have to. We're not doing that. The yes, spaces exist. The, the, the space is there already. It's just the signage. No, 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 no. We <laughs> own from the property line, wherever the street is. Okay, mm -hmm. we own it. Now, if you're not, if you're going to say, okay, put a fence on it and and grow some stuff on it, that's on city property. We're, we're not saying that they could put a fence on it and grow some stuff on it. We're saying, we're saying don't, look, don't look at don't don't make them correct a violation is there, there is no the whole malibu is a violation on right away if you drive on any street people have gone all the way to the right away and beyond vice chair this and, is and, not and, anything and, different. And, and show me in real estate law is all written 100 percent of it okay show me where it says no no harm no foul mr donegan does this have anything to do with what we're talking about so the the, the the most recent question from from Commissioner Maza, I was a bit unclear on regarding the, the no harm, no foul, but regarding the the overall issue regarding, you know, encroachments and or potentially existing encroachments and what Coastal Commission may or may not do. You, you are right, Chair Smith. It, it is a bit outside of the purview. Of course, if there was an attempt by this commission to attempt to remediate that problem, you know, that would be, you know, yeah, that, that, that's probably a bit too farsighted in terms of what's before you tonight. So well, you're so saying that we have no purview uh, over city land. Uh, creating Very good. New, not what I said at all. New, I like uh, that, and, Mr. Hill. Thank you, Commissioner Hill. That's good. Thank you. I it, like that. It's prettier than me. Uh, but but I wonder, I wonder, do we have any comment about that? that it's basically a construction fence, right? I mean, you're not supposed to have chain link out on your what what do, would that fence need to be replaced back at the actual property line? That's a temporary fence. That's her fence. That's a temporary fence that's been there for a very long time. A lot of exactly, properties exactly. had chain link fences in the front of them, and that's the way they are. I, I know we had to put up a chain link around my property after the, the Big Rock slide stuff and the house was yellow tag for a while. And once the yellow tag was lifted, I don't know who it was because I was living in Seattle at the time, but somebody, the city, I think, came in and said, all right, you got to take the chain link fence out now because it's not, it doesn't comport with code. So well, I don't know. Well, but this, once again, this doesn't have anything to do with what we're talking about tonight. We need to, we've got a motion in a second. And I think and we, we have other things. We've discuss. got another, we've got another project. Okay, but I have other, <laughs> other things to discuss. Um, what are we doing about the deck? Tyler came up with some language for us to review at my request. We have another rooftop deck. Again, we have standard language, which he's going to have. We have a house that is viewable from a quiet neighborhood and a LIP required view street. Okay. So are, is anybody willing to discuss restricting use of rooftop decks? Not on this one. Have you, did you go to the site and see where the garage is? It's out in the middle of nowhere. Here's my concern about the the roof. It, yeah, that's 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 true enough, but it's about five feet from the property line, and there's a house like five feet on the other side of the line. 
So it's about 10 feet from the neighbor's house. It, it is not 10. I, I don't understand where you're getting 10 feet. It is way more than 10 feet away from the neighboring property. This, this thing's out in the middle of nowhere. It's in the middle of the property. You're talking about the, I, I don't. Maybe I was looking on a different. You're, what you're, no, what you're looking at is the old garage. The old garage is going to be demoed. So the, the old new, garage new is a lot closer to the property line. The new garage is inside. You're right. The you're, right. you're right. You're right. Brain fog. <laughs> no light restrictions <laughs> on, on hanging lights. No restrictions on uh, furniture on the roof. No restrictions on sound. No restrictions on when they can start when they have to stop their party. Nothing. Uh, Is that what we're going to do? All due respect, I just I don't see it here. There, that thing, that thing's God. What I'm telling you, that property is just unbelievable. The, this garage is. I I I give all my teeth for this garage and to be there. It really this thing is. Have, have you ever seen a rooftop deck you didn't like? <laughs> Yeah, a couple of them. We've, okay. we, we've come close on them, uh, Vice Chair, but this is not one of them. That's for sure. What about the house above it? What about travel? There's nothing by this thing. There isn't? There isn't a house did next, you, next did door. Did you go to the site? <clears throat> There's a house go? directly next door to it. It's Sam Hall Kaplan's house. Correct. Did Mr. Kaplan make a comment about the rooftop deck that's at the back of the Mr. property? Mr. Kaplan is, is, is part of this transaction. But that doesn't mean he's going to own this house forever. What, what I just would like to know is whether neighbors were notified and actually understand what a rooftop tech could be and whether they're made, they're made aware of the implications. You know, what I don't understand is, is in the last, what has it been, a year or two years, we've become fixated on decks and the noise and the people gathering there's going to be parties and there might be dancing and there might be all kinds of stuff and yet people put in swimming pools with decks around them all the time and nobody says boo i mean it i just don't understand the obsession except that it came from one case where the neighbors that oh my god they're going to be looking down at us it's and, because ac acoustically when it's high up it the sound can propagate without obstruction uh, there's another reason you low that, down there that's that's the that's why we that's the decks versus swimming pool argument. we have yeah it, the, the real reason is in the last 10 years we've lost a third of our population a great deal of that is because of short-term rentals and picassos okay? you sure? sorry because there's what is nothing that, what to stop there's nothing to stop any of these houses from becoming party houses. I'm pretty yeah. sure Cynthia is not going to have <laughs> have this well, problem. We do not. Issue. We do not give permits to individuals. We give them to properties. People are willing. Our properties change ownership and they change use. Okay. We never, ever, ever, ever should consider who we're doing it for. It has to do with the property. Oh, I so, like this person is not an excuse. Okay. So every so every every house has to be looked at as a potential party house, and every amenity in that house has to be restricted in order to make it unattractive as no, a oh exterior as a party. noise sources and light sources. Exterior noise sources and light sources are what we can regulate. Okay, I'm going to suggest that we've heard your concern, and uh, I don't think that there's three votes to support it, and we've got another item. So if, if there are other I'm items that you have. Motion. I'm I, going to make a motion. I have two questions still. Two quick Go ones. ahead, Commissioner Hill. Uh, one, wh what's going on with the extra wall on the garage? It, it looks, on some drawings, it looks like it's freestanding, like a retaining wall. But on other drawings, it looks like it contains TDSF, um, for example, the fuel modification plan F1.1. That's a question for Tyler. What is is that structure or what is that area that it that it captures there? Um, Elaine can chime in. I think it's just an architectural design feature. The site is pretty flat, so I don't think it's a retaining wall. So um, there's, no, there's no possibility that we've missed TDSF there. No. I don't think there's a roof. 
right, okay. Elaine? Okay, my other question is just, just for my understanding, uh, the staff report talks about how the minimum lot development criteria in RR1 is one acre minimum parcel size. Doesn't that mean you can't have more than one house on an acre or less, but say you had half an acre within that zoning, a blank acre, you could still build a house on it. So it, this would be a concern if they were subdividing, but it's not a concern when you're merging. It has to be. It has to be less, less non-conforming. So they made the second the lot two a little bit bigger by re removing the Black. driveway easement. They made it a little bit bigger, which made it qualified as being less non-conforming. It can't be the same amount. No? It has to be affirmatively less. Well, it's supposed to be. No. Okay. Uh, this, this, I can have this discussion with staff at another time. I, I'm just it, well. They explain it in the staff report. Okay, yeah. so we're, yes, we're, we do a roll call on the. Let's take a roll call. I'm making a motion. Uh, uh, there's a motion on the floor. I know. I'm making another one. Okay. You mean you want to amend it? You mean uh, whatever amended motion, whatever you did last time? Okay. I'm making a motion that that encroachments on city property are not allowed, and number two that. The rooftop deck should not have string lights or any any uh, any pro protrusion above uh, 18 feet, and must be uh, light censored. Is that one motion or two? That's one motion. The second one has to do with the restrictions on the rooftop deck. That's one motion. I, I don't think you have support for that, Vice Chair. We have a second. I'm, I'm with you on the rooftop deck. I, I just, the street doesn't seem like an issue at the moment. Okay, you wait till the lawsuit comes. Okay. <clears throat> okay, Rebecca? Uh, did you want to see if that would be acceptable to the maker and seconder? Oh, no, that, that was a, uh, a substitute motion. I believe Commissioner Peake already rejected that amendment, but I will, of course, defer to him. Correct. Right. Okay. Then uh, Commissioner Pink. Yes. Commissioner Jennings. Yes. Commissioner Hill. Yes. Vice Chair Mazza. No. Chair Smith. Yes. Motion carries. Okay. On the next item, I'm going to recuse myself because I live right across the street. Um, so I will see you later. Bye bye. On this item, I would like to make a motion for continuance because there is no landscape plan in the packet. We have to have a public hearing, don't we, before motions are made? So we we, we, we didn't continue that. I mean, arguably, I guess we, we, we have done that this before in terms of when time does not allow it. Um, mm -hmm. Since it is only 938 and people may have stayed around, it's not it's probably advisable to open the public hearing, receive comments, and then if that's the will of the yeah, commission to do that. But of course, that, I, I do not believe that is legally required. Okay. What's, not, what's not legally required? That, that if it was the will of the commission right now to continue the item, that would be fine. However, that is, you know, that, that, that is typically done due to the fact that we are under time constraints or, or it is done at the beginning of the hearing, excuse me, beginning of the, of the, a meeting so that people do not, you know, yeah, stick yeah. around and, and, and wait. So it would be my advice to open the public hearing and receive those comments since we are not under a time constraint, nor did we do that. However, that advice I, I will say is not legally required. Got it. Okay, here we go. 5B, Coastal Development Permit Number 21-033, an application for a new single family residence and associated development. And we have Adam to give us our wonderful staff report. Thank you, Chair. Good evening, Commissioners. Uh, as noted, the project before you tonight is uh, Coastal Development Permit Number 21-033 at 6626 Sumira's Drive. Next slide, please. Uh, here we have a vicinity map uh, showing the project outlined in green along Sumira's Drive. Next slide. 
and uh, a photo of the site prior to the uh, story poles being installed. It's a, currently a vacant site. Next slide. Uh, minor correction here on the total square foot uh, in the presentation and in the staff report. Um, some missing square footage from the subterranean basement and uh, the light well. So uh, it's a minor correction of a, about 82 square feet. So it's a total of 4,733 square, uh, square feet, one story single family residence, two detached garages totaling in 1,517 square feet a 1,087 square foot basement below the garage, uh, 226 square foot detached surf, surf shack with trellis, a tennis court, swimming pool, spa, and associated equipment, on-site wastewater treatment system, hardscaping and landscaping, that should say landscaping, and grading and re retaining walls. Next slide, please. Uh, here's a look at the site plan um, with the house uh, on the front half of the lot towards Zemira's Drive. And about uh, the rear third of the lot is a steep slope. Next slide, please. So look at the front and rear elevations of the single story house. Next slide, please. Uh, we received some public correspondence, uh, three letters of support from neighbors, and one letter we received today uh, from a resident expressing concern with the construction vehicle parking along Zumira's Drive. Uh, which should be part of the record now. Next slide, please. And staff recommends the Planning Commission finds that the proposed project is consistent with CEQA and approves the proposed project as conditioned. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, disclosures. Commissioner Jennings? None. Commissioner Peek? Okay, Commissioner Hill? None. And, and neither for me. Um, we're on to public comment. Ms. Evans? Um, the applicant team uh, is represented by Douglas Birch. Okay. No other hands raised, huh? Okay. Yeah, Alex, thank you. Yes, good evening, commissioners. This is Doug Burge. I am the architect for the project. Um, just a few things we wanted to note um, is that this house is um, and always was an 18 foot high house. Um, the clients themselves are an incredible family that are going to be using this house for their private use, not as a development, which is always something that comes up. Um, the other thing that I can report is there is no roof deck on this house, so we don't have to put any conditions on about a roof deck. No, then uh, we have to continue it so we can get one on it, please. Well, thank no, you. you. You haven't even heard the conditions we put on a pool deck yet. Exactly. <laughs> um, it's a little bit, it's interesting in this design because most of the, um, you would assume that the garages are actually in the front yard. But in this particular case on the sun orientation, is that in this part of the street, we actually are taking advantage of the afternoon sun being so then the front yard is almost like a backyard. And then that's why the driveway goes behind and the garages are behind. So it's not a typical configuration. There are other tennis courts throughout Point Doom. We are not allowed lights, as we all know. Um, there was an issue, uh, questions uh, earlier today about parking. Um, we intend to fully comply with whatever the requirements are about construction parking in Malibu. And also we'll go on to um, the chosen builder, which is not determined yet, will obviously be available and making sure that uh, any uh, neighbor who has any issues will be fully available to address those as in any other job that we have under construction. So the owner is available and uh, they're listening at this call. They would be available for questions, as we would also. Um, we're very excited about this project. We thank the staff for getting us to this point. And um, there was a discussion by um, Mr. Uh, Commissioner Hill about landscape plan. We do have a landscape plan. Um, I'm sure Adam can refer to it, and I'm unaware that it's not part of this um, presentation, but um, that's been addressed and designed and put through all the requirements of approvals for the last few years. So um, that should be there. 
So we will address that um, as a question as we need to, but thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. If there is any other member of the public present in the meeting who wishes to provide comment on this item and had not signed up to do so, please click the raise hand button at this time. And seeing none. Okay, closing public comment back to us. <laughs> Mr. Hill. Yeah, sorry. I, I only noticed it late this afternoon and I didn't, I forgot about it when the we had the initial plan, but the landscape plan is part of the application. We didn't get that. At least I didn't get it. Um, and I, if anybody else, if everybody else got it, then maybe you could still pull through a quorum on it. But I don't think we can hear it. What is effectively an incomplete application, as trivial as that might seem in the big picture, we're, we we have to look at whole applications, right? Did 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 any did others get it? Well, we know it's all drought tolerant, so it's it's not really exciting. So, how do you want to do that? Well, my motion is to continue, just because it's a matter of form. That's that that's something we need to see. I mean, we don't know. I don't know. I don't know if it's if you know. I mean, I know it's Doug. He's not going to do something crazy, but uh, you know, maybe the who knows. The client is just insisting on a bunch of palm trees, and he finally capitulated. Or I don't know. You know, I think we need to see what it is. We we know that's not going to happen. So, uh, Director Malika. Yes, the for whatever reason, yes, the landscape, the specific landscape plan was inadvertently laid out. Nevertheless, uh, the architect has the landscaped areas shown on the site plans. Uh, a number of the A sheets have it. The landscape plan was reviewed by the city biologist as well for compliance with our fire resistant uh, landscaping ordinances and also the LIP. Uh, we can also, uh, Adam, work, I think, to do a screen capture and send it over to Parker to put it up for the commission's benefit if they would like the exact species listed, but um, you do, there is a, the shrub areas, um, we can go through them if needed, but they are the areas where they're showing some landscaping around the property. The, for example, on sheet A-0.1, uh, that has the, the, the planter areas and, and patio there between the, the sports court and the house. Uh, the next sheet has it blown up, uh, so be glad to uh, answer any questions. And then, Adam, are you able to email over that sheet if it's the commission's pleasure to Parker? Yeah, doing it right now. So, Chair, if you would like Parker to put that up, Adam will uh, send him a copy of the landscape plan. That's if, fine. If needed that's, for the commission. That's fine. But I'm not going to continue it. If we got the opportunity to, to at least see it, let's. If anybody's got anything they'd like to talk about, Commissioner Jennings, your hand is up. Yes, we have in the past, um, when there have been concerns raised about uh, construction, uh, uh, parking, and all, and the rest of it, in terms of laydown yards and all the rest of that stuff, we have uh, years ago we adopted the practice of putting a condition in saying that uh, prior to the uh, issuance of permits, the, uh, the applicant will produce a construction management plan covering parking and all of the other concerns. And uh, that would be submitted to uh, building and safety and had to be approved by building and safety prior to the issuance of permits. Is that condition or words to that effect uh, in, our, uh, in our resolution? I know something I have to follow on all the jobs that are that I've had I've run into um, like this that you, maybe the parking was going to be closed so you you do figure out ways to get people parked so yes there are a couple houses under or with story poles and under, so this is going to be a busy busy construction street I mean I I don't see this being an issue here for the size of the house relative to the lot size and how and, it's going to likely if, be if nothing else. They can they can park on the on the tennis court area 
through the whole house getting built to take up, they can stage on the tennis court, they can park on the tennis court. There's a lot of happening. room there. The reason I raised like the question that. is because uh, it, it, we adopted this practice in order to avoid having to uh, have the commission try to detail out exactly what is going to happen in terms of who's going to park where and all the rest of that stuff. We left it to, to building and safety for that very purpose. Because everybody in, in, you know, think of places like Naranda Lane and places like that. I mean, everybody has always got concerns about where people are going to be parking. And it's not really our job. It's not our expertise to figure uh, that stuff out. That's why we have adopted the practice of leaving it to building and safety. But uh, it, but we do have a, a standard condition which says that a construction management plan will be submitted to building and safety and approved prior to the pulling of permits. And that's what I'm trying to find if it's in our resolution. If it's not on our resolution, I'd like to submit that it ought to be there. I would agree with that. A million percent. Okay. Um, oh, oh, sorry, Craig was up. Oh, okay. Um, there's a huge storage room in as a basement. It's it's huge. Does it not need a second egress? Or why doesn't it? Because it's a storage area. But I mean if you could just turn it into a you know playroom or whatever. Oh my god, that never happens here. Why would you think that? <laughs> I mean, but you know, if you have that much stuff to store, you're gonna be spending a lot of time down there. You might need to escape by a different route. I, I guess the question is, what what are, what are the rules on this exactly? I would think that when it's turned into habitable area, it needs to have a second exit. Then and only then, there are no other cases where it need doesn't need to. I guess you could ask the architect, Commissioner Hill. What say thee, Mr. Burge? <laughs> Commissioner Hill, always great to hear from you. So this is, we're talking about the uh, storage area under the garage, correct? <laughs> it's also a basement under the, we're talking about the storage area under the, under the garage. Yeah. Under the yeah basement, the, correct? The, the big arena down there. Yeah. This is definitely a storage area. That's the party uh, arena. Yeah, no, exactly. Looking over the, the, the back lot. Um, no, this has never been talked about, but, um, you know, this is always saying if somebody's going to do something illegally later, you deal with that legal later, or is there something that can be addressed uh, as we're doing the working drawings that would allow for um, a, a, another way in there or out of there? Um, I guess we could look at it and put it put it down, but that's not the plan. That's not what we had intended to, to have it for um, because it's not under the house. Yes, it's under the garage. That's considered a structure, so I guess you can call it a basement. Um, and a habitable basement definitely needs two, two uh, ways out. So we can certainly look at another way out without getting into um, any kind of hillside area that would be, you know, over a slope. Um, and we could address that, uh, Commissioner Hill, if that's something you want us to do. But again, we're not planning on that use. But well, yeah, no, I'm not here to redesign your project. I just, I'm not clear on what the rule is because it seems like every time there's any, I mean, this, let's call it, just call this a basement because that's functionally what it is. Yes. Every time we have a basement, there's like, oh, where's the second egress? And now suddenly we're saying no, and it just because. Well, yes, it's a at any time. Yes, obviously, if it's over six feet high, it's considered a basement. Um, in this case, it's like that. Um, you know, to stop any kind of doubt, like I said, it would be not a lot of trouble on our end. We're not redesigning really anything. We're just there's a current opening down there now, and if there's an opportunity to create another one, um, then that's possible. We had never looked at it. I'm just saying it's possible, um, and it's something that could be handled in the building and safety stage, if that's something that you want to make a statement about. Yeah, let's Director. hear from Richard. Thank you, Doug. Go ahead, Director Malika. Muted. muted. Apologize, I'm sending Adam the, the language so we can get it up on the screen that would address uh, Commissioner Jennings' comment. Doug, Doug, uh, I, I you know, made the point. As a storage area, it's, to my knowledge, 
it meets the egress requirements. It's being permitted as such. Should the applicant change it in the future to something, uh, they'll need to obtain a, a permit to make it habitable. And at that time, then uh, the, the egress requirements that are in place at that time will apply. Uh, this would be a situation of planning for somebody to uh, to convert it. And so uh, if the commission's will, if there's a majority vote to add a second means that that, that could be done, um, this will be plan checked by the building official as well. Oh and this also, and Adam, uh, that plan was also looked at by the fire department, if I'm not mistaken. They also reviewed these plans uh, for access requirements as well. So if it is permitted in the future, there's not a free pass because of what happens tonight. It'll have to meet whatever codes are in place at the time. It, it seems too, I don't know what the, the pros and cons are, but that if you did have some thoughts about converting the space to something else later, getting the egress in now would be the efficient thing to do. But uh, that's, again, I'm not designing the building. Um, <clears throat> others, other other uh, comments on that one issue? Um, I have one, yeah. I, I, it's, it's a temptation hard to resist that the idea that, oh, well, this person who is designing this building or who's going to live in this building is really a, a, a proto criminal and they're going to uh, change the design in order to uh, uh, get away with something. And, and it's a temptation, but we really need to resist it. We're supposed to be judging the applications that are before us, not something that might be turned into something else. Um, and if it's turned into something else, it becomes a code enforcement issue, and that's not our responsibility. Okay. okay. Um, Peggy North, if they, if, they, if they turn it into criminals later, that's up to them. But right now, we're not going to worry about all that. Okay. Next question. This is probably for, I don't know, Tyler or Richard, or I'm sorry, Adam or Richard. Um, uh, the, the tennis court looks to be about, I don't know, about a foot from the front fence and f or from the street. And I don't know exactly, but uh, it's very close up there. How does that interact with the, uh, you, you know, you can't have more than a four foot fence in the, in the front <laughs> setback or up to six with the view, you know, a tennis court, don't you need at least eight feet? So what, how, what are we doing here? Well, for the tennis court, it's uh, slightly below grade, so they're getting about two feet from the the plane of the tennis court, and then six feet uh, for the fence next to it. Um, I'm sure uh, the architect can speak in more specifics as well. So, so the, the top two feet are, are probably a lot of the tennis court fences view permeable. And there's a separate fence right in front of it that's also view permeable from four to six feet or 42 inches to six feet. You know, what Adam, correct me if I'm wrong here. The the tennis court is two feet be below. There's a cut there below road grade. Mm -hmm. And then you have two feet of retaining wall between the cut of the tennis court and the road grade. And then you've topped the retaining wall with a fence that is view visually permeable of the permitted height. Correct. And the reason why that's allowed is that when you have a retaining wall that protects a cut located in a required yard, you are allowed to place a fence of regular height on top uh, of that retaining wall because the retaining wall is not visible from the street. Our code really doesn't care about what you see from your front window. It cares about what the person driving down the street sees. Yeah. If this were the opposite situation, where we had a fill situation at a two-foot oh. wall, that wall would contribute to the overall height of what they have. So, in essence, um, they they're going to the top of the chain link will be higher than six feet when you're in, standing inside the court, but no higher than six feet from the street side. Right. Okay. 
Um, and then th there's a trellis between the garages that looks like covered functional space. Um, does that or and has that been counted as TDSF? What's what's the rule on? I mean, it's actually like it's I don't know ha quasi habitable space because it's Richard. If I'm wrong, but I believe since the trellis is technically open to the sky, it's not counted as TDSF. So, yes, I was hoping to find an exhibit to that effect here. Yeah, so the question this. really is how open to the sky is open for something to count or not count? It looks pretty our, open to me. Yeah, our code just uses the word open to the sky. So if when you stand on it, you get rained on, uh, we have considered that to be open to the sky. Well, hang on. On this, you would probably get rained on, but it's not it's not open in the sense of all you see is sky. You do all you see right. is sky. It's a trellis. And a trellis that's open that doesn't have a covered roof on it at that size is not counted as TDSF. This is just rafters or joists. There's nothing over the top of it. It's not going to be covered with uh, vines or something. All right. Well, vines would still let water through. We don't have the landscape plan, or, or do we have it by now? I emailed the PDF to um, Parker and Alex, so they should have it. There we go. There we go. Holy moly. There's do, no do you want it zoomed in somehow or? Yeah, or if somebody could just give us a tour of salient points, I mean, you know, are there any invasives or uh, who? It's, this is hard. This is really hard to just look at it and say, oh yeah, that's great. or you know, so like, if it passed through the city biologist, it's not going to have any invasives and stuff in it. I don't see what the right. No, you're right. I mean, that's not really much of a conversation there. Yeah, and Cor there, Courtney's, Courtney's already approved this. Correct, and there is a condition uh, for no invasive and only native plantings. Right. The biologist approved it. We, in our discretion, may have different concerns or considerations. And we haven't really absorbed it or studied it. So what what would we do? We're, we're not going to change anything. This falls in the category of unknown unknowns, right? You know, if you don't know if there's a, an issue until you see it. I mean, I don't know. This is an approved landscape plan. You asked for that. You got it. It had to go through all the things it goes through, and mm -hmm. it couldn't be where it is in front of us right now if it wasn't. Right. I, I'm as a matter of principle and process, I'm happy with the rest of the house, but I would be voting no just because I, I haven't had a chance to really study this. What I'm looking at right now is completely illegible. It's so tiny. It means really nothing to me. Well, it's so tiny. It means really nothing to me. There yeah. is there a part of it that you'd like to have zoomed in even more than this? <laughs> Here it comes. Again, this is all prints. I want to be able to have this on my table and look at it for half an hour, you know? Okay, so that's that's a completely fair argument. When you look at it right now and what you see, is there anything on there that would cause you to change it or anything of alarm? I or literally you would like to focus in on? I literally can't tell what's going on. I mean, I'm just, my. I don't have good eyes. I need to look at it uh, in my house with my magnifying thing and, you know, so. Um, well, I'm looking at the right side and all the way that I know how to tell something. I don't know family in order, uh, which is to the left of uh, of uh, Carolina Laurel Cherry, uh, Prunus <laughs> Carolina. So um, these are things that are approved. I, I'm not sure. You can't put you couldn't go through all this if it's not good to go. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. And all I'm saying, principle and process, I want the whole application. Okay. I'm I'm outvoted yeah. three to one. I can tell it. So you know you don't need. Right. To... Is there any, any other concerns with this? Uh, like not let's not the on not on the landscape plan. If we can't look at it and read it the way that it is here, then let's just we can. Yeah, no, I think I'm, I'm good with the rest of it. So no no issues on the house. No no other issues. Um, I mean the, the size of the house looks like it fits the neighborhood. Everything else. I'm a little concerned about how close they are to the four to one slope, but I was unable to visit the site because I've been so sick. And so I, 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 I don't really have a, uh, you know, a definite comment on that. 
Yeah. Um, well, having visited the site as a child, <laughs> not a long time, maybe with a BB gun or a paintball gun in the backyard, um, <laughs> I would just uh, add that, yeah, it does definitely, it falls off at the back there, but I don't think that, you know, there's a reason why Doug has cited the project the way that he did. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I think he's pretty cautious. And no, I, I, I can't argue with it. So, well, I don't, don't have to argue with it. It's just you know, it's a, it's a well thought out plan. Should be complimented. There you go. Someone want to make a motion? Uh, I will make a motion to approve um, this project located on uh, Zumas. Paint Gun Road. I'm looking for my, <laughs> my plans in front of me. For item 5B. <laughs> staff's recommendation. Boom. Um, would you be open to an amendment to include in the resolution? Yes, the construction parking plan. Construction parking plan to be submitted yeah. to building and safety. Yes. There are construction provisions in here, but it, not the one that I was talking about. So what we're looking for... Uh, Patrick is uh, that prior to the issuance of any permits that the applicant will submit a construction management plan uh, to be approved by building and safety prior to the issuance of any permits, which I guess was redundant. But anyway, that's the idea. I think, and also, Commissioner Jennings, I, Adam's got his hand up. I think he's probably wants to clarify that for us. Is that correct? Yeah, I. Yes, thank you. I, I do have the language here. Prior to the commencement of work, the applicant shall submit a copy of their construction management plan. The construction management plan shall include a dedicated parking location for construction workers, not within the public right of way. That's typically the one. typically this is included in the the public works conditions, but for some reason it was not included um, in their approval. So we'll we'll add it in. Great, thank you. There you go, um, Rebecca. Do I have a second for the motion, please? I will second it with that with that amendment, yeah. Thank you. Commissioner Peak? Yes. Commissioner Jennings? Yes. Commissioner Hill? Sorry, but no on principle. You got a record to maintain. Chair Smith? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Motion carries. Okay. Look at us. Yeah, what do we talk about for the done. next hour? <laughs> <clears throat> I have to decide whether to go to the hospital or not. Jeez, well, you probably should just take a run down somewhere. I tell you, as one who has spent a lot of time in, in uh, St. John's and UCLA emergency rooms, I prefer the ambiance of the St. John's, but the food is slightly better uh, at UCLA, <laughs> so keep that in mind. <laughs> Oh, wow, that's that's a tough trade-off. Actually, that has been the question, like, where yeah. are you? Any yeah. interest yeah. from anyone in a motion for adjournment? Oh, yeah. Field trip to the emergency room? Oh, okay. In San Diego lost. San Diego State lost. Oh, oh that's too bad. 7956. My son-in-law, who, who went to San Diego State, and his dad both went down there, the school chartered a flight or a plane and a lot of San Diego people went down for the game and they uh they've been there since Saturday they went to that you know they got to go to the exciting game and they were there tonight uh I during break though I did look and and uh uh saw that they had lost but what, you know they got the there and that's terrific what's the score big 79 56 oh big. Yeah. yeah they had a rough start I've been getting updates from my husband so, Chair Smith, did I hear you motion for adjournment? Oh, yes, I did. Sorry. And do I have a second? I, I'll second it. Chair Smith. Oh, yes. Commissioner Jennings. Yes. Commissioner Hill. Yes. Commissioner Peak. Have a great evening. <laughs> motion carries. Thank See you, everybody. Guys. We're going to be vocab, Commissioner Hill. If, if they do any cognitive tests on you, you're, you're going to pass with flying colors. Well, I, I no, I, I feel really blurry. <laughs> uh, you know, it kind of comes and goes. That might be a really good reason to go, Craig. It, it, it kind of comes and goes. I, I'll be fine for an hour and then messed up for an hour. So, you know, I, I figure I'll just uh, see how I go. Okay. Hi, everybody. everybody. Good night. <laughs>